he's just going to come in any second. All right. Hello and welcome. Episode 13 of season two of The Crackdown. Today we have Fabivin joining us from his geography classroom, actually. He's actually still in class right now, and he just decided to, you know, prop up the phone and, you know, just go straight into it. I mean, Thor, what do you think about the setup here? This is the first uh, Cam interview we've got on the phone. It's either that or, you know, because he's in Fnatic and he wants to get in the starting team, he's in Daylor's wine closet. So it's just like in the background, Dale Law is actually like telling him like no, no Red Bulls ever in your entire life, uh, pure oxygen only, and uh, you know just study macro every day of your life. Jesus, man, Jesus. Think one thing I don't understand, right? Feminine is it's, here's the thing. I know everyone thinks EU pros are toxic because in America that means have a spinal cord. Oh, I can actually stand up for myself. That makes me toxic. But okay. <laughs> I don't think Feverman's toxic. He has known those someone has like, yo, strong opinions and all the rest of it. I can't believe that turn he had to take. Where in the off season it was set up for you, Feverman. Everyone was like, oh, sick, we're getting perks in Fnatic. And then when they obviously found out, like, oh, it turns out you need money to get perks. Who the fuck knew? When they got like, <laughs> when they lost Reckless and they didn't get perks, everyone was like, oh, we're doomed. Us Fnatic fans are doomed. Boo hoo. We might have one split where we don't make the semi final. Boo hoo. And then all of a sudden, right? They were like, oh, good news, guys. We've got Nisky. And then everyone was like, <laughs> all the EU fans were like, you know, we out from LCS, right? We we saw this keep playing. He's in splits, like he hasn't, you know, he doesn't had like a fucking six million dollar man surgery upgrade, has he? And he fucking tanked it in LCS. What are you talking about? So then, though, you were set up perfectly because then they sort of low key were like, oh, and by the way, we've also got Feb. So people were like, oh shit. If they ever have any problems, just bring Feb in. Then we got a sick lineup in it. And then this guy went out of his way, right? Like in this interview I did as well, he was just going like, oh, I think I'm fine being the backup man. You know, I'm just here to help Niski do all. It's like, what is that? Why is he done like a baby face <laughs> and trying to be a hero? Now he's just propping this guy. What I would do is this. This is the way you should have played it. You should have mind gamed him. You should have come in and gone, gone. oh, Niski, what do you think about the fact that, you know, we're sharing a role, you know? He'd have gone like that. He'd have gone, well, here's the thing. I think, you know, we should support each other. And whoever gets to start and spot should. And you should just go, yeah. Yeah, I agree. Now get the fuck on that bench, Steph. Go on. You start supporting me. And there you go. You played him. You got the nice guy. You played it against him. I mean, I, 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 I hope he's gone. playing the long con because if you ever want to yeah, get Niski, so. like I'll tell you as somebody who, who's who's good friends with Niski, you ever want to want to get that starting spot, poison kebab. He's going to fall for it every time, dude. Yeah, there it is. There you and, and you just get the spot for free. So, you know, I gave you I gave you the, the setup. So how, how has it actually been being in Fnatic, being in, in, in the UK team? <laughs> um... I mean, honestly, like the the NLC league, yeah, is uh is very very <laughs> underwhelming. Like it's very low, like compared to playing uh, LEC mm -hmm. or just playing LEC scrims. You know, going to playing in this league, it's very underwhelming in terms of like uh, skill. And um, it's it's like the competitive games and the scrims, right? Because you scrim against the uh, academy teams. Mm -hmm. And occasionally we scream against main team, uh, Fnatic main team, but that's very um, like that's like once in three weeks or something. Um, but um, I mean it's fun. Like it's um, obviously it doesn't matter really what team I'm in. I'm with a with a cool group of guys. They're you know they're all pretty young I would say, and they are um, you know very very hungry to to learn. And I feel like I'm kind of on a, on a different page, which is completely fine. But obviously my, uh, I want to get back to playing LEC as soon as possible, right? Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I'm just trying to stay, I guess, in shape and try to uh, perform when it matters. You know the worst thing, Dom? You won't know this because it's just you know, like it's not even the top ERL, obviously, mm -hmm. and it's like an obscure set of people. Like aside from Feverman, you're not going to know anyone. Like there's there's no one anyone's going to know, right? But it's almost like they did okay. trick him. They were like, you know what? Here's the thing, Feverman. Even if you have to play on the you know the the sub team, it's all right because we've got we've got air. And then they say it really quick, like dear lord, and he goes, dear dear lord, yep. Oh, I used to work with them back in the day. They were like, yeah, yeah. It's like it's like oh, we've got mom. Can we have dear lord? It's like oh, dear lord, at home. And it's just just. just Polish guy called Dear Lord. Like, that's actually the name of the head coach. Go look it up. It's actually real. 
Dude, what do you smoke before going on this show? Right? Listen, I don't need to smoke, mate. <laughs> when I die, make my ashes into the newest fucking strain, the Holy foreign shit. strain. And I'll fucking, I'll change yeah. the minds of a generation. Holy boy. shit. Imagine just like we're all like 50 years old. Yeah. We're just smoking Thorin every day. Yeah. <laughs> like, Listen, obviously Feverman can have a, a trim in for his garden. You know, grow his own little fucking Thorin strain there. Let his children <laughs> take up. Oh, shit. So anyway, but reckless. Yeah, it's like, Jesus Christ, it? end up. Yeah. Oh. Fuck to yourself. <laughs> Fuck to yourself. Like, all right, like, nice, man. We fucking got it. So, I mean, what I, what I really wanted to ask you about the league is, uh, like, most people, I guess, don't really know about the strength of NLC because, I mean, one of the teams actually made the finals of uh, of, EU, of EU Masters, right? So, yeah. is it just, like, really top-heavy? Or, like, what is your opinion on that XL team? Like, did they overperform in, in terms of, like, what you thought was possible um, in EU Masters? I honestly, I, I really don't know. Because the skill, like, I don't know how good are the other ERL teams, you know? Like, we didn't even scrim um, most of those that went far. Obviously, besides Excel, I think they're they're okay, you know? Like, they just play, like, they play like a team, you know? They play like, uh, they're the best team in the LEC because they have, uh, you know, good, good players in every role and they are just uh, outperforming, like, every team, which is not that hard on... Uh, you know, just playing consistent. But um, I don't know. I think the, this, the, there's obviously some really good individual players who have talent, uh, which I can see that will probably rise to uh, to LEC because um, I naturally have a kind of an eye for that. But, like that Arome um, guy? We haven't heard of him before, but you know. I did you he... see that tweet for, at them, Dom, from the fucking owner of XL? Did you see this tweet he made over the, like, when the, all the EU Masters final was going on? No, no, I didn't see it. Right? You know, one of the biggest problems in esports, right, is when the owners of teams, because oftentimes it's just a businessman or someone, you know, maybe ran a team, but in esports in a different game, they try and come in, like, and be like, oh, I know loads about the game. Like, I saw that fucking daft cunt who runs Schalke, the Reichart, one of the, their clan, just doing a tweet, like, is El Yoyet the first player to ever win LEC in his first split? And it's like, you really love this game, don't you? What the fuck are you talking about, you dumb fuck? Of course he is, and there's loads of people who've done it in LEC. Like, <laughs> Perks did it, that? Biven did yeah. it, like, Goonie well, did it. Did right it. Yeah, no, like, ever, what the so fuck? Similarly, okay. similarly, right, this guy from BTXL, when he was listing off all the things they'd accomplished by making the final, right, his first thing he named was, like, scouted five players that have LEC potential. It's like, oh, did you scout that fucking <laughs> might have some LEC potential. What was, did you just watch LEC then? What are you talking about? And then he tried to backtrack it. Like, no, no, I just meant like the potential to be an LEC. Because, you know, when you have been and you're not anymore, it's, like, it's, it's not even the best DRL. Listen, we were banging on the guy last year in Rome. It's not like we said he just can't play League of Legends the game. He's obviously okay. Mm -hmm. And by the way, the Hattrick guy's been around forever. He's not even like a brand new player. He was someone who was like mm -hmm. on people's lists years ago, wasn't he? Like, so he, like, he just he was over flexing on that one. And he tried to do that thing where it's like just own it, just be like, Haha, sorry guys, don't know the game that well. Well, obviously, you don't. That's why you bought a fucking NLC team, respective that bit. But whatever. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Listen, it's his life, so I had to sort of bring it back at the last second. Oh, it could still get a better Febby. Could still work, mate. Well, I mean, what was your decision to decide to play, like, a regional league? Because you're obviously someone who, like, most people, like, know your talent level. I mean, I know in, in spring of last year when we were on these shows, you know, we talked to Perks. He said that he thought you were the second best mid laner within um, LEC at that time. So, like, obviously you have, like, rapport and value. People, like, know who you are. Did you think about, like, potentially taking a year off, like, potentially, like, playing solo queue in Korea, like, doing one of those types of, like, you know... Uh, journeys outside of just competing because it seems like for, from like what you've said it's not like the competition is super high or that you're really able to learn that much from a regional league having played LEC for so many years um, I've obviously thought about a lot of different stuff um, but I think the main thing that I came to to peace with with myself is that I um, it just kept coming back to me that I felt like I am too good to quit right now like i am in my at least in the beginning of the year or during the off season i felt like i was peaking and i have put so much work into into this that um it would just be such a waste if i would stop um and i think the case for playing solo queue and trying to get back and going to korea and boot camping and stuff or potentially streaming i think um i would be more off the radar that way um, I think uh, 
Fnatic giving me opportunity to play in their in the academy team is um, a very good way for me to kind of stay connected in a sense. Yeah. And um, obviously, just uh, making sure I I maintain like my skill playing playing five v five, making sure I improve on um, you know helping out my team and uh, making sure I'm just you know feeling well, doing well, and performing. And that way, I'm confident that um, if things were not going well in the in the main team, or even if they were, that um, I'm very comfortable anytime to step in and you know play. Mm -hmm play the best League of Legends I, I have ever played. So that's still inside of me. And um, <clears throat> yeah, I just that's and also I think um, I've been able to stay in a really good contact with uh, Elias upset. I've been helping him a lot during during the split because he has been having a hard time. And obviously he's a he's a good friend of mine. And uh, in what sense I, just like emotionally or something you mean? I mean, as a player, he looks pretty good. I mean, he's just like uh, like a brother to me. I just uh, I can see how how good is this guy and how much potential he has. And um, he, I am kind of you know trying to guide him in a way where he feels good and he obviously he will he will always play good. This guy has no issues with his play, but it's more I can see he has difficulty with um, obviously because he's young with leading the team and um, making sure that. Um, you know, people are confident that they should follow him and that um, he should try to be um, more emotionally, like, stable in a sense where he, he will get more respect from his teammates and, you know, lead, kind of kind of grow into that that guy that, that, the, that, that the team needs right now because I think that's something that they really lack from observing the team in, in the spring split and that's become very clear to me. So um, obviously, as an outsider, I try to uh, help him as much as, as possible, just staying connected to him. And uh, honestly, that feels good because I feel like he's progressing. So just that feels really nice, while also just maintaining and being ready to step in there whenever. By the way, one thing that I think would be interesting to transition to now is if anyone's been... like I always used to joke about that stupid thing that fans just tunneled on, where when they saw you reading those like self-help and improvement books years ago, now we're talking like literally like four or five years ago, they were all going like, oh my God, he's going to join a cult with a theme. Did yeah, they're like, he's lost it. He's know, trying to be like, smart. <laughs> like, what the fuck's wrong with him? Like, <laughs> I know, it was totally reasonable. He wasn't even doing it. If anything, he just had an open mind. He was like, oh, interesting. I'll take a lot of ideas. Right? I know that Feberman is someone who puts a lot of thought into the idea of like improving and like he's saying there, like he doesn't think his peaks behind him. It's still possible to become the best version of him, etc. But you're in a scenario that actually I think most pros in League of Legends are scared to be in, mate. Which is when they can't get the LEC slot, or sometimes like they have an option between like a good ERL team or like the worst LEC team, and they're like, oh fuck. Like basically, it's like the forgiven scenario. Should I join the worst team? And not literally the absolute worst, but like, should I join the worst team and look bad in LEC, or should I try and look the best in ERL? Like they have it, they find it hard because they know, right? That unlike what you just said there about like you're still trying to improve and stuff, they're gonna do the excuse LCS players do like, oh sorry, I have bad comp I have bad scrims, so there's no way I can improve and my teammates aren't good enough. And like people feel as though either you can't show your skills off or you can't improve. You're gonna be playing against worse players, less experienced players. Do you think you've cracked mentally how to like still practice to your top level and play top level, even if the players you're playing against aren't the best? Um, yeah, I mean I definitely felt that this this split that um i become more my own competition because when you play lec and you play lec scrims obviously you get tested way more just in terms of uh, you know everything like your laning phase your your team play blah 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 everything is connected um but i think that i have created a work ethic for myself where i um i know that i'm my own competition and i, I don't need I'm not dependent on how good is my enemies and I'm not gonna um, obviously I'm gonna get I'm gonna play better when I play against better people because naturally that's what happens because I kind of get more into the zone when people like when I play against caps for example or play against you know the good players when you know they're really tryharding and you know every every mistake you make that they will punish you right so you just have more focus I mean well right now I will go into a game and this guy will write in all chat that he's my biggest fan 
<laughs> so then it's already <laughs> before the game starts. <laughs> Jesus. Like, then, then already, like I am already, I can sit with one hand in my pants, and then I can still win. <laughs> so it's Come like, on, like, red, red. like All right. <laughs> you, you, it's like, it's just like, that's why it's just harder because you need to actually push yourself more when things are easy. And um, sounds like they're playing with one hand in their pants as well. Oh, oh god it's like so, it sounds like they're playing with one it's hand in Sebi's like, pants actually yeah. like, it's like it's a season 5 MSI and I'm fake oh I'm playing against Feverfin oh shit yeah I hope you play Zed <laughs> but it, it's definitely harder to um, to to push myself and to push my teammates because my teammates are obviously rookies they've never experienced playing like LEC and they have not played LEC scrims and they have not been to many tournaments so the mindset is just very different and me coming to peace with that and accepting that and trying to you know help them while also being okay mentally myself because if i'm not if i'm not present then i there's no way i can do that for my teammates so yeah I mean, how do you it's deal just, with the uh, frustration of it? Because, like, I mean, personally, like, I was in a similar situation. Like, when I got banned, I was forced to play. Like, I couldn't play in LCS, right? So when I got banned, I had to play in Curse Academy. And, like, making that jump down, like, was super hard for me. It was super frustrating. I mean, I, way, I, if people don't know, it was a way bigger drop down than it is now to be in Academy, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, like, it, was, it was pretty big. But, but yeah. either way, I mean, it was like, you know, you go to Worlds one year, you're on a top team uh, in NA, or, like, I guess technically in the world at that time right and then you go to playing yeah. academy and it's fucking tough right so how do you deal with the frustration because for me like i didn't really i didn't really handle it that well after like six months i just like quit i'm like if i play lcs i'll play lcs but i'm not i'm not playing this shit anymore like how do you deal with the frustration how i do with the frustration i think because um, i'm sure you watch that... lec right like you watch lec and you see players that i'm sure you think you're better than them or you know you're better than the players that are that that are at least some of the players that Gosh. are within lec right so like how do you manage that yourself um i mean first of all what you said about like being better than for example players that are in lower tier teams oh. um I am at a point right now where I wouldn't even want to play in a in a team that would for sure that I would think that would be not even content like contending for playoffs. So but don't you think like any team would pretty much contend with playoffs like if you were on it? Like cuz that's how I would, like I, when I yeah. look at, at you right and I think about like how you you generally play like your lane control and th like I feel like you could join any team and you would have we a play chance to play. Vitality, they're in the playoffs. Yeah, exactly. Today. That's what I, I, I was thinking you about. Know. Vitality. Yeah, I was thinking about listen, SK. Yeah. I was thinking about Astralis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you know. You no, know, yeah. yeah, but okay, okay, yeah, I agree. I can probably make playoffs in in any team. Yeah, but then getting into playoffs, um, for example, it was the same with Misfits, right? I was in, I was in, we were in playoffs, but then we couldn't even beat Rogue. And then I was thinking to myself, um. Might as well just not have made playoffs. Like if we are just gonna go in the first round and lose, because that clearly means that you have not put in the work. Yeah. And it when it comes down to best of fives, it's it's all about preparation. And you can already tell like how how your team works that it's not. I mean, some best of fives are really RNG, because both teams are just like clearly very very similar in skill, and they they are just like. It's not like uh, when you have G2 against X team. Like you always know that G2 will probably win at least the last years, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. But when you have like uh, Misfits against Rogue, two teams who have insane amount of rookies, then it kind of is just more more flippy, right? And the but the team that has more prep preparation will win. So yeah, for sure I can get to playoffs. I've been to playoffs so many times. I think the first time I didn't get to playoffs was in NA uh, after so many years, mm -hmm. and then it just um, you go to playoffs because, or I play this game competitively because I want to win everything. I want to win the playoffs. And I'm not going to go to playoffs. I'm not going to play in a team that I know by knowing how good players are from studying them and observing them. Um, I already know that they're not going to make it far in playoffs because they're going to face X and they're going to get fucked. Mm -hmm. So then it doesn't matter how well I do because I am, you know, I'm one player and you're 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 playing with four other guys and mm -hmm. you need to kind of have that 
obviously I always have faith in my teammates. Like I'm not going into the games like, oh, we're going to lose, blah, blah, blah. But it's like in the back of your head, you... Yeah, you know, you know. We, like, you know when a player is going to get outclassed before the match even 100%. starts, right? Yes. Um, but um, wait, what, what what did you talk about? The, what was the first question? Uh, I think it was about like the... the like, what did you make all oh, these the frustration. Yeah, teams the frustration. Yeah. How do you deal with it? I mean, man, if I... Aren't you big into like meditation and stuff? If I didn't like get so into psychology, I would have... I don't know what would have been happening to me. Like, number one thing, yeah, meditation. It's like really s saving my ass. Mm -hmm. If I'm not if I'm not meditating, um, when I have stress, I go completely not crazy, but I just become very irrational. Irrational is that the right word? Yes, yeah. irrational. Yeah. And uh, I just start because I'm a very emotional person. I start to do. Um, very emotional i i just become very reaction like reactional and and in, in emotion mm -hmm. emotional sense and this is where it goes back to when i was like 18 and 17 like growing up playing this game from when i was 14 i would always you know get very mad and blame my team and just be kind of a victim but um i'm able to kind of be on top of everything when i feel well and when I'm able to take stress in and I'm able to deal with situations that I feel like um, should be tackled. So if there's a stressful situation, then I'm able to, you know, um, take that without getting mad or something. Because when you get mad around younger guys, the first thing they will do, they will get mad too or they will get confused. So this is only going to be destructive. So um, I think this, this industry needs to weigh less victims. This this game is full of victims. I think the whole, maybe okay. I mean as the headline as the headline for the vote right down. Yep, there it is. This game is full of victims. Generally, like I don't know about other games, but at least for League, this game is. People are so like sensitive and so. Well, the, I, mean, I, I feel like it's the know, nature like, of the game, no? Like, like when yes. you think about like how the game is, yes. like you're, you're one in five, and it's such a teamwork focused game that like it feels like you don't actually control that much of like the results. So it's like hard to like. It's very, it's very like rare where like a player is gonna be like, okay, even if I do my like one percent better or two percent better, like is that gonna actually affect the overall outcome of the entire game? Like, don't you think that's just like the reason why the game like produces such players? I mean, definitely. Yeah, this game is made to hate, hate yourself, and I think this and is hate where humanity straight up. Like, this is, is where is. the I think the commitment comes in and the, like the the dedication from the pros that are really pushing themselves and kind of the one percent that are they know at the point where they are really good at the game that as you said the one two percent is not going to be the gameplay part it's going to be the the psychological part where they are able to improve on a daily basis on the small things mm -hmm. for example playing solo queue games and not tilting which i can still not control completely and it's still very hard for me because of the nature of how i've kind of progressed as as a, as a as a as a human and as a player but um at least i'm very aware of it and i'm trying to um progress my 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 brain in a sense because my problem has never been my gameplay mm -hmm. i will barely have bad games i will also not be the guy that's you know 20 zero every game but at least i have my uh, my basics right and i just try to build upon my brain now because my hands have always been there yeah, I appreciate the way he sort of has done his own like fucking Dr. K session on himself. Like, and why do I think that is? And he goes, it takes me back to when I was 14 playing the game. Like, all right, yeah. fucking hell, he's going deep here. No. I agree though, Dom. Like, it's a point I've made many times. As someone who's played loads of other esports games, and people don't know this, I've said it many times, I play League of Legends like for fun, right? I've now learned not to do that. Here's why I play League of Legends now. Because obviously, you know, sometimes you want to chill, like waste an hour. I don't do it for fun, right? Because what I'm the mistake mistake i made was this thinking like oh you know like i'm gonna enjoy i'm this. gonna do some i'm gonna do something in three hours so why don't i like spend the first hour i'll play a game of league and then i'll do mate that'll put me in a bad mood for the whole day because the worst thing about league <laughs> i always actually. say is cause a game from beginning to end is one entity 
And it's all affected, like it's all connected. Like what happens at like fucking the first five minutes can affect minute 20, can then massively affect minute 30. And like the worst thing about League is when, like you say, either you're behind, and even though, by the way, the game isn't over, like if you die like the first two times in the first few minutes, like even though people go like games lost, like that's like the fucking Cadrill super sick analysis and fans are like, oh God, get him on Worlds now. He said the game's over after a scuttle crab, but okay, I don't have the fucking the same British accent, so I guess it's not as cool. But basically when that <laughs> happens, right, obviously the game isn't really over, but you uh, know from playing a million games, well, now it's just a lot less likely I can get back into this particular scenario or I need him to make a mistake. The worst feeling obviously is you're doing well and you're all in and then some idiots playing like fucking Renekton top playing and feeding all the time. And you go, oh, fuck, now I have to not only beat my guy, but I have to potentially make up for him and is he going to feed more so you just get this sinking feeling it's not like you know you've lost but that sinking feeling it's despair dude you feel like existential despair while you're playing the game and then you get that moment in it that i've never experienced in any other esports game which is the moment where you actually are like you feel like you're fucking trapped in the matrix and you just want to get out like that scene where you're like, <laughs> yeah. that phone is trying to get out like not like this like you're just like get me out of this game and then you're trying to vote constantly sort of surrender and because it's eu west they're all just putting no even the guy who's down seven kills, he's like, I want to play on in this game. You're like, oh. this is hell. This is hell. You know I, that I'm that person now. Philosopher, you know the f- saying by the philosopher, Sartre, other people are hell. He was talking about solo queue. He just actually, you know, he, he just saw into the future because that is that is hell. Your own teammates are the hell. The opponent, fair play, he's winning the game. This is hell. Because if you play Counter-Strike, by the way, Counter-Strike's the opposite. Even if you're getting wrecked in the game, as long as someone isn't cheating... You can still do what you're going to do in the game. Yeah, you know what? You yeah. get better guns as they get, like, you always get back in the game with the economy and just the way the game works. Like, I've always said this in Counter Strike, because the score is static, if they're up 10 rounds, right? If you just keep winning each round, eventually you win the game still 16 10. Like, it do, they never get like an advantage from being ahead except for like for a round or two. Yep. League is just the feeling where, like I say, it, 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 the negative snowball is one of the worst I've ever seen in a game for fun, that is, mm-hmm. you know. It just I ruins mean... the idea of fun. I think this is the thing with League, and like this is actually the, like the hardest part. It's like what you said when most of your, at least I think most of your practice is as a pro is like solo queue, and mm-hmm. there's a lot of pros, and generally everyone wants people to play solo queue, and they want to spam 20 games a day because they think the more games you play, the better you get. Which I agree, um, for most players, yeah, but as a pro, you get to a certain point where playing more solo queue will actually like make you worse and i think i kind of went through that at least um this split and like a little bit of last year where i was um um like very like my solo queue habits were kind of taking over where for example i would spam ping people or i would write stuff in chat or i mm-hmm. would you know as, as you said like you know give up and stuff but i've noticed that um just coming to to peace and like accepting that whoever in your team is gonna int. Um, right now, I'm I'm always playing with chat off. When before I could never do that, I always had to flame people. I <laughs> so I sometimes do still spam ping people because I mean it's just it's just a sense of frustration, right? Like mm-hmm. you just have to get it out sometimes when someone I mean, is zero eight. That's like not, that's not toxic, is, you know. That's like when, when when someone is zero eight, then I think this guy deserves to be spamping. Like you don't need to insult him because it's not gonna do anything. But I'm playing with chat off, and as soon as some people start spamping, I mute them because people are just like so pro- provocative. Yep. When they're like spamping and they're writing like question mark, why why are you not coming? What are you doing? You should have went in. Why are you griefing? You're so boosted. Blah blah blah. And like this stuff makes the victims you know and this is why most of the people are like that and the people like maggie felix who have chat off they never ff they always try hard they don't ping their teammates when they're behind they just try to make the best out of every situation literally Uh and uh, they are trying to kind of share that with like his teammates as well not like he's writing it and stuff, but he's at least like showing a good example. Yeah, he's like demonstrating it. And this this game is full of so many younger guys that don't know how to be an example. And I think um, it's just a shame that that the game is such a pain for so many people when I think most people started playing the game for fun, but now everyone probably is like, yeah. I think there's very little people who actually can have fun 
um, playing the game still. And I think for pros, most probably would agree that solo queue is... Um, it's at like the worst state it's been at. That's what everyone always says. It keeps getting worse because the player base keeps getting bigger and they keep coming more like victims into the league. <laughs> more psychopaths, and, you could say. <laughs> like, these yeah, people are yeah, just yeah. crazy. And more players means less games with like the, the, the best pros, more OTPs. So it's just... Um, I don't know. It's just a, a big combination of a lot of stuff. Yeah. No, but better. I mean, I'll even say some of it's like on all of us when we play. Like, I know when I play, like, I play support, mate. I'm not joking. If, like, the AD carry just doesn't go in on, like, the first three levels when I attack, like, I just give up instantly. Like, I shouldn't, <laughs> but, like, mentally, I'm just like, he's only fucking. And then it's like, and because I'm Pike as well. Listen, I'm not, I won't even lie. Like, you can't, you won't find my account, right? I just literally do type like I will be roaming the whole game. <laughs> <laughs> Whether I do or not, by the way, sometimes I'm blind. I just come wow, up with so, levels so, <laughs> But I'll, I'll, I do type that. Like, <laughs> so, 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 so Thorne is just terrorizing Solo Q yeah. himself. No, Basically, I, I play League of Legends like the old Dota 2 meta where it's like there's three people on one layer. Like, I just start playing with the mid laner then like just <laughs> in that push the whole game. I'm the dickhead who ruins the other mid laner's game at that point. It's like, right, my game's ruined. Time for you to have your game ruined. See ya. No, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, man, the most the most release you'll ever get, like, in terms of endorphins while playing this game is not even, like, flaming people. Like, it's, like, very momentary, but then you kind of, like, feel bad after if you have a contest. Like, oh, man, like, he's probably, like, trying his best, yeah, like, worked, like, a nine, nine to five, yeah. you know? Like, you, you start feeling bad after. The best release you can get is you don't type anything negative. You invite them to a Discord call, call after. You screen share, and you make them watch what they just did in a voice call with no, you. No, 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 no. No, I'm no, telling no, you, no. like, it actually, it almost, it's the only time that I've interacted with players and had, like, a good response afterwards. Where they're like, yeah, I messed that up. Yeah, no, I, I guess we agree on things now. Okay, cool. And you just, like, leave the call. Like, it almost always is way more civil than if you try to, like, argue out in game about a play. Like, if you just share your screen in a Discord call, of what's happening in the game and you look at it with somebody else, it's it's perfect, man. It's the best release you can get when it comes to, like, any type of, like, disagreement within this game. I swear, man, voice comms need to be added. The thing I wanted to, yeah, to ask you, uh, Febby, was, you know, you talked a lot about, like, victim complex, right? And I feel like you're in a situation where you could have easily had this victim complex, right? Like, I'm, I'm sure, like, from my perspective, like, obviously, like, I... Like, I, I like you as a person, but, like, from an unbiased perspective, I act I believe you belong in LEC, right? So... For you, like knowing that you most likely belong in LEC and not being able to, to play, how do you like control the whole victim complex in your own situation? Because I think it's really easy for you to go down that that line of thinking. Because sure. like, from my perspective, you are like a victim of the system in a way. So, like, w how do you then like use your like, hey, I'm gonna not try to be a, a victim and rationalize how you got into this position? Um. Well, I think it comes with just accepting the situation and just like being in peace with where I am and realizing that the game, what I'm doing is not the only thing I have in my life. And I am not going to let my work control my, my, um, happiness, my person, like my, my happiness, my personal life, like my, yeah, just my overall well-being. Um, so over the years I've, like kind of created a more balanced lifestyle for myself where I would take care of my my body, my mind and uh, obviously create relationships with people and just have um, you know, having the opportunity to, to travel um, obviously playing LEC um, being contracted to Riot, they the, the contracts are pretty nuts like in terms of salary. I think they are <laughs> kind of, it's kind of crazy how many, how much money people get for being so useless. Uh, but I'm very fortunate that I have, um, you know, generated some, some wealth that I can, you know, spend outside of the game and uh -huh. create other ways of, uh, you know, feeling good. So, and then just we, the we all know what he means by it. He's not being clever there. He just means in life. Obviously, not like, oh, I can. I, th I thought he was like going to the red light district. I know. Like, after his his like, <laughs> Jesus, man. Yeah. I'm like, all right. <laughs> it's like, I get the best shit. I get pounds of that shit. I'm loud in this motherfucker. <laughs> Keep going. But then just the, like, just the, just the confidence, like, added to that, which I built from all those things together, mm. is that, um, 
I am good enough and I will be good enough and I will perform when I have to perform. So, um, yeah, just not relying on one thing and not making one thing tear me down when it goes bad. Um, I think that uh, it's very important that you don't just, you know, have one thing and if it fails, it's your, you just don't put all your ask, eggs in one basket. Yeah, well, I mean, by what... the way, I don't know if you know about this, but like I actually in the off season did an interview with the old Aaron Air. Obviously, he's around still as a coach, and he actually totally disagrees with my perspective. Like, I personally think a lot of the bottom teams that picked up loads of rookies, we won't say all the names because you might have to play for one of these teams, but we can all guess who they are. We listed some of them earlier. Some of them, right? I get it when they're trying out someone like, uh, let me think. Who would be good? Like, Armut's not a bad example. Like, there's a, a player who showed some skill. You know, there's reasons you could bring that player. Or like Magic Felix, example. for example. Yeah, the, Magic Felix is an obvious one that should have had a chance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. But the, some of the ones where it's like, these guys weren't even that sick in the ERLs, mate. Like, this is pushing it. I personally think they just did that because you can sometimes pay those guys less money than like an actual veteran like you might want, right? So I'm very cynical. But Aaron Ayer takes a different take, which has, he, he made a good argument for, I will say, which is he says in the modern day, a lot of the coaches, because they do want to have more input on the game than they had before they don't just want to be the guy who drafts only they want people who are rookies because it's the idea that like you know you have the beginner's mindset and you can mold this guy whereas like they think unfortunately people like you i mean i know people like crown aren't really like that old in the game but people that are kind of like a known quite freeze would have been an example a couple of years ago they think like oh feber and Svebin, you know he's he's gonna do what he does he's gonna play mid lane mage he's gonna look like that fucking guy from firefly about 20 years ago and he's gonna you know <laughs> fucking easy <laughs> whatever and then you know he's not gonna be molded or whatever so actually that's why i was trying to bring up the mentality aspect because to be fair like it sounds like you're trying to make it like oh no i can still be coached i can like improve and stuff because basically the problem is if you think you are good enough fairly seen like you should be in i can understand some players i can see why coaches would be against that idea and they might think oh i can't do anything with this guy he's just going to be like you're just going to be the eighth best player on the position or something mm -hmm. Okay, that's uh, <laughs> that's open ended. Doesn't have to be a question. It's just a scenario. All right, sure. I know sure. I threw you with the whole thing where I totally nailed that you look exactly like that guy Nathan, whatever from fucking Firefly, and now you've <laughs> realised your whole life's a lie, and he's probably going to play you in a movie in about twenty years. Jesus, god damn! Look it up. Google the Firefly. I, mean, I just don't it's understand. Guy, it's a guy from that meme who goes like, uh, "Yep," yeah. and then he goes and then he doesn't do anything. You know when he got like, a drink into that. <laughs> so if you could just do that for five seconds get the meme off this <laughs> jesus man i mean so i mean what, what i was thinking about like during this is like okay so obviously if like your talent level and like the way that that that, that you play the game is not being perceived as like worth it by these lec teams to pick you up there must be like some disconnect between like their perception of you and how you actually play so what do you think is that like main disconnect that makes like lec teams not view you as like as attractive as your skill should be have you been able to like rationalize that at all like what do these teams like think about you or why do you think these teams are not like reaching out to you and in reality they probably should um i think it's a combination as uh Thorin said i think it's the Obviously, the the orcs always think that, or they have like a standard belief that the the older guys always will ask for more money, which is just um, a fact, which is actually true, obviously. But then um, the other thing is the the rookie part, the the coaching staff in like the, the like like the coaching staff in in esports are, is very young. And I can tell you that many coaches are probably intimidated by a player like myself because um, maybe, I don't know, I, I'm not, like looking at the coaches right now, I, I'm not going to go specific, but I think I've probably generated the most game knowledge and like um, like the most experience that any player could get, kind of um compared to a coach and i think coaches always like coaches are not very 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 try hard in esports like they are not very pushy they are not very strict they like to you know be easy and just you know make people listen to them and they don't like to be you know they don't like to discuss they don't like to be pushed they don't want to be told that they're wrong because they don't even like know what they're doing is right at least some of them. That, sure. that, that, that's, what, that's what I believe. And obviously there's exceptions, right? But I'm just yes. talking from my experience what I, what I think. 
and there's obviously there's there's nothing wrong with that but it just creates um, obviously it's easier for the coaches to coach younger players and they are cheaper so why would you not go well like there's already two arguments and then there are also there's like the the growth curve right um compared to like something that's inside of me in terms of like leadership and like psychological and um that i would bring to a team that is not something that you can see on paper this is something that you will need to see in real life and have to see the work ethic kind of like work its way you know what i mean and when you see there's a rookie that has one klp in solo queue two accounts in top 10 they're cheap and they're young then it makes sense they go for that guy but I think that's just generally what teams like to do and that's that's completely fine and um it's not like anyone is like i mean maybe there's people like oh my god we're, i'm missing out we should have gotten this guy with so much experience he could have helped us in game he would have made that clutch call blah 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 he would have you know carried us on stage or something or give us more confidence but those are things that you cannot see on paper this is just something that's inside of you and mm-hmm. has to show like on a daily basis you know I mean, what happened to the idea? To it, oh, I, I just want to say, like, what happened to the idea of surrounding like rookies with like veteran players? Because I feel yeah. like that's kind of been lost within like EU. Like now, it's like teams have preferred to go for like these all rookie teams, where yes. the old formula used to be is like you can have like a few rookies on a team, but generally you want like veteran players around them to be able to like shape their habits and like accelerate their learning. Do you think that this is like not utilized enough? Because I feel like veterans still should have like you know be able to like kind of like impart their experience on their teammates yeah i believe that um, you should have the like a right balance yeah i think you should have two or three veterans and then you know two or three rookies depending on how how good they are um but obviously it's still really hard to i mean the word veteran is like very broad and every individual is so specific that of some veterans might not even bring anything and they might just drag your team down mm-hmm. and this is only this is based upon opinions from players that you've played with or coaches or the public perception uh, perception because it's crazy how many like coaches probably read reddit and they're like oh this guy is shit so that guy might be shit when they don't mm-hmm. actually think things through or maybe this is a bit out of um Maybe I'm being a little bit too too harsh here, but I've seen this happen, and I think this is uh, not the right way of, of of seeing things. So, yeah. Yep. The key thing to me is like I noticed when you were saying that, like maybe they talk to their players or they hear what the community perception is, or they ask maybe your former coach what's he like or whatever you know. One thing I want, I wish all these coaches would do, because uh, I think it's the only responsible thing to do. But no matter, as I say, we're not talking about a scenario where it's like the next like super sick guy who's obviously got like mad skills, is going to become like Larson or Caps or something like humanoid. It's not someone obvious that's going to be amazing. You decide in between like experienced guy, but the question is, will he still be good in my team or up and coming guy? And how quickly can he get good? And will he ever get good? Right? In my opinion, to be responsible, they shouldn't just go off other. But they should interview the person. They should like bring someone like if it's Crown Shot, if it's you whoever nemesis they should bring this player in they should do an interview because i can tell you by the way there's not many pro players actually can basically lie very convincingly like they're going to give away in the interview that they, that they don't believe it like i'll give you an example the reason i reference nemesis there is i actually hope genuinely he doesn't ever have plans to be a pro again because when he made those comments recently right i know they he probably thought they were throwaway comments where he basically said like he wouldn't be coming back to lec now he's in korea you know and if he did he'd want to be on like a top team he doesn't want to join any team and then he made this comment and this is where he gave himself away he should never have said this part he said something like you know like and besides i make more money you know than most of the teams like just streaming it's like dude that last part killed your chances right there no one's ever going to pick you up because the problem is your play in lec the last time you played isn't good enough that like i'm going to bring you into like a top two three team and i'm not going to like replace yeah. someone so instead, mm-hmm. I'm bringing you back in this scenario, exactly the kind of February scenario. I want to bring you in because you have experience and you were good. But what I need to know is that on my team, which is probably going to be a little bit worse now, you're going to be fully committed and you're ready to, like, you know, revise your career. So if I ever hear that, like, like in that, what he's essentially inadvertently admitting there is, like, well, money would be one of the main factors I would even come back for. It's like, well, I'm only, I'm only here for people who are all in competitively. 
Like, no. in that scenario, even if our team's worse, you have to want to play because you want to play at mid lane. Like, or you, you want to be the best player again. The money part comes after the fact. If you play well, you can get a contract the next year. Like, that, I reckon if you interview these guys, a lot of them would give away in the interview if they wouldn't be coached or... They, like, even if they tried to lie, they wouldn't be convincing, you know. They, they could sell it. That's why, to me, the angle you're going with earlier, but, like, you're still trying to, like, practice properly, even though you're in, like, one of the worst... Well, not the worst, but one of the worst ERLs, not one with a lot of stars and stuff. That That's, like, the key thing to sell these guys on. Because I will say... I do think some of the players who are veterans who could come in, if they did go to like the 10th best LEC team, and it wasn't a weird scenario like this where like Vitality actually does have good pieces, say it was like what the Astralis lineup is, and you're just taking like, like Manager Felix did. Like in that scenario, I think there's a lot of veterans that are good enough to be on that team, but they wouldn't play their best on that team. You know, they would just mentally give up or they mm -hmm. wouldn't like, they wouldn't keep yeah. killing themselves like they would if they were on like a team that was a contender, you know. I, I, I can see the coach's side of it as well. I think I think both sides have got, got good points, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's, uh, it, it's really interesting. I mean, I, I think the thing about Nemesis is like the decision wouldn't necessarily be about money. It's like, is he okay with his career being what it was, right? Because he only played like two years competitively at, at sure. the top level. And even though he was on like Fnatic, like he, he was the type of player where, you know, like you think that like, I, I don't think it's, it's impossible to believe that he wins an LEC championship one day. It's like, is he okay with his not. career? not ever winning an LEC championship, like not like placing as high as possible because, you know, with his talent level, it looks like he could actually have like, you know, done a lot more. So I think that that's like the real question that like for me that I would like ask him, it's like, are you, are you actually satisfied with where your, your career is? Because it's not, a, it's a, like, it's not that's a why it's worrying though, Dom. Think about this, right? Literally what just happened right now. Abadagi just left and went to hundred thieves. Mate, if you put Nemesis on that team, they're like the same fucking player. Like yeah, that would that would potentially be a contender, like they were this split. Like yep. to me, I, like I know what he meant by that. He was just being honest. And then again, I don't think he was intentionally being like I only care about money. But I, like I'm saying, it sort of betrayed like where his head's at at the moment. You know, so you, were, I'd have to, I'd have to feel like you were coming back to do this. I'll give you a quick example. So a lot of my friends in CS:GO who were big name commentators, like Henry G was like the main color commentator in the entire world, won the esports award. Moses was like a guy who was a color commentator and was a former analyst. Was like legend in the game um who else yanko was a guy who was the analyst on the desk with me and then he went and coached these guys right all took gigs where henry g became like the gm of cloud nine cs go team yanko became the coach of two of the biggest teams like phase clan mibr and then moses most recently was the coach of team liquid right and one thing i've noticed just from observing their careers is the reason why they failed in part is because they only were willing to take the best possible gig, but in their case, for a job they hadn't done yet, right? And their philosophy started like this. Instead of saying, right, well, I actually also want to be a coach, so let me just pretend I wasn't all those other things in esports. I want to be a coach. So what I should do is start with like a medium level team, you know, test myself out, show that I'm really good, make sure this lifestyle's for me. And then if it is, I'm all in. And then I'm going to go to the top team. They all took these amazing offers because they, same scenario, they had like, when they were weighing the scale up, the other side of the scale was like, well, if I stay as a caster or an analyst, I can make like $200,000 a year. I'm going to be huge. So I'm only going to take this deal if it's like the best possible team. It's like, in that scenario, that ain't the right reason to do that. Like, you want to be a coach or a player. You have to really want to be a coach or a player. And that's, that has to be number one above everything, in my opinion, because that's the only thing that's going to sustain you when you have a bad period in the game, when a teammate plays bad. Badly, when maybe things aren't going, you're not a playoff team, etc. You have to really want to be good at that job and to want to improve it. You know, you can't just do it because it's like, well, yeah. that'd be cool for one year. You can't be half in in esports, I don't think. Yeah, I think it's really hard. And then I think once you become like on the streamer side, like Nemesis did, because I mean, I experienced it myself. Like, it's it just you start like weighing all the pros of, of streaming and it's like the, the pro of being a competitive player is like that moment, like when you actually like exceed expectations and like the euphoria you get when you like overperform on stage and like, you're like, yeah, you're doing really well, right? Like that amount of like confidence, that feeling is better than anything you'll ever experience in streaming. But it's so hard to like go from like, you know, a situation where, I mean, we've heard from people in the team, we, we heard Bwipo talk about Fnatic uh, recently, and he was like, yeah, you know, like, it was a pretty negative environment. Almost everyone that goes through Fnatic comes out the other end was like, yeah, that was some tough shit. You know, it's like, it's like the TSM of, uh, of EU in that, yeah, in that it is. You know, scenario. So it's hard to, like, go through one of those really negative experiences and then go to streaming where, like, streaming is always, like, you're always operating at, like, a seven or eight in terms of, like, the, like fulfillment scale is what i would say satisfaction yeah, yeah like in terms of yeah in terms of your own satisfaction it's always pretty good you know it's like okay like i mean you're getting you're getting money normally like you have a pretty good experience on stream but it's never like great the same way being a competitor is so that's like what you really uh, have to like assess is like do you want that like 
that potential to hit that like nine or 10 on the satisfaction scale? Or do you want to just live at like a seven or eight and just be like set? I mean, I've actually been thinking about this a lot lately where I think that, um, you know, the older I'm, the older you're getting as a pro, or at least like personally, um, the more teams I play with, the more people I meet, um, I often question myself, um, if I want to keep putting myself in, 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 in environments where I feel like I'm not being pushed, um, mm -hmm. like on a, like not, not, not like on a, on a league skill level, but like on a psychological level, like in terms of just growth, yep. like as a, as a human. And I think that for example, in your case where you're a streamer, you have so much time alone. Meanwhile, I will be going back to Berlin and I have to play in a gaming house where I'm pretty much with the guys for the whole day. It's completely mm -hmm. fine, but it's also very can be very taxing depending on the people you are with. And um, comparing that with, you know, being alone, potentially getting, you know, um, building relationships with other people um being in the, in the country that you want to live in because you you just love your the, like the country you can kind of you know decide if you have i mean the, that, Nether the netherlands you know. is a sick fucking country going from the netherlands to germany is not so shit like I, i've spent a decent amount of time in both germany is just a worse version of the netherlands with germans in it like what do you mean with germans in it? What is it? i've always said germany's a great place problem is the germans what does that even mean Thorne? what the hell it's just a fucking pithy way of saying it man no, i just don't like germans man i've said it every time. oh I, my I, god I don't, Jesus. don't have to pretend it you yeah know. no i mean I, like I, no, I, they're just, it's not my style you know yeah no i mean right. i i understand I, I just feel like my style i i, I think i think for my style i'm like more like partial to germans because like i'm kind of with that like like hardcore like just like efficiency like type like mindset of just like say what the fuck okay. you mean and then just like you know, like get out of there, you know? So, I mean, I, I'm, I'm kind of the opposite in that regard. No, but what I was talking to more is just like the vibe. It just feels like the Netherlands is just a more like relaxed, like happy country is what I would say. Like something about like the environment sure. just makes you feel like good compared to like, like Germany, which is very like, it's very like go, go, go. It kind of reminds me of like New York city in a way where it's just like, it's very, uh, yeah, it's very, it's very go, go, go. But yeah, I mean, what, what I was kind of like referring to like, or before when we were talking about, uh, like mindsets. I feel like for myself, I just have to challenge myself in other ways. That's not like league of legends, you know, like even in, 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 in like, um, what do you mean by that? Like, give us an example of what you, so like one made. thing I did was like, I, I tried really hard to just like have like physical goals. This is something I'm thinking about doing again. Like where I was like, okay, I just like want to like get to like a, a better physical okay. part than I, than I, than I was, you know? So I was doing like, a, like really like long, okay. like strenuous like incline walks and things like where you know like you get like drenched and <laughs> he's stuff. literally learned to walk again he's like oh, i just want to walk again one day no but that type of stuff was like good for me like you know like yeah, being able really to like good, yeah. have like your own like goals and like overcome them it's like i remember like it was like i would put the the thing on like a 15 incline which is like pretty much the max and then i would do like um i would do like 3.5 speed so it's like a pretty like fast-paced walk but on high incline and the the time that like i i got to like hitting like an hour and being able to do it and like not having like my, my calves and my legs like give up. I felt like that was something that was really fulfilling for me. It was like a way that I challenged myself physically, like challenging myself like mentally in terms of like reading like certain books and like trying to like, like ad advance the way I think. I think that those are things have been really like, like outside your comfort zone, you mean like some, well, give us an yeah. example without, if, if it's not going to be too like fucking funny, is there an example? Like what sort of books are you trying to challenge yourself with here, Dom? Um, it's not like, it's not like, like crazy, like, types of books but i just really like like um certain authors like Mal malcolm gladwell like people that make you actually right. start thinking outside of like yeah. the box where you're like oh like this is like these sure. are concepts that like you vaguely understand but you don't actually like think about that directly um i read the book like how to win friends and influence people like i thought classic one dale carnegie yeah, yeah. dale carnegie i thought that, that one was like i've a... read that one for sure don't worry yeah, but I feel like those types of books, like, they, like, change the way you think. And, like, after, mm -hmm. like, reading it, you feel like, okay, this is, like, a different perspective yeah. that I haven't, like, fully explored yet. So. I'm going to say, though, if Feverman did read that book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, it didn't work. He's on fucking Flags Academy team. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, no. Maybe read the book yeah, again, that, Feverman. Yeah, yeah. See, see if the second it... time around works. <laughs> Jesus. That, that's, that's how it works, yeah. Goddamn. <laughs> 
Peppermint shows up, he's like opening up and Thor just it's roasting right. it, man. It's all right. It's all... Yeah, it's because, you know, it's a social lubricant. Just make it all nice and fun. Yeah, just make know? it feel that's like a piece of shit. I lie. <laughs> I, lie, I lie and say that and just flame people really. Good. Yeah, it's like, no, no, no. Like, like I, that's the no, same I thing I say. Gotta, if, uh, basically, the premise is it's the same as you would do in the game. In the same way as in the game, you're not going to be challenged in the ARL as much as you would at LEC. Same as outside of the game. Like, unfortunately, in this scenario, if you don't have some coach who's like some next level guy, you, you've got to do it yourself, haven't you? Like you're saying, you've got to set challenges you got to do things that push you outside your comfort zone find mini goals like you're saying to get like the 15 incline for a certain amount of time like yeah. stuff like that people don't know even if it's a minor thing like to a fan they'll be thinking why would you walk like that matter? because if you know you started and you were trashing it you get a sense of accomplishment when you can do it yeah you get the the like the euphoria of like oh shit like i overcame something that was like hard for myself yes. and it doesn't have to be like it's like i'm sure there's people like could be something it? simple for LEC players like only have chicken nuggets three times a week you know <laughs> really blow your minds culturally guys I mean, I was just thinking, I was thinking earlier, so you have a player like Fabivin who's like meditating on a mountain, and then you have another player like eating chicken nuggets, and then you're like, which one do I think is going to be more open-minded? It's like, nah, the chicken nuggets guy, like the 17-year-old chicken nuggets guy. Because, like, that guy play, because that guy plays 20 games a day, and I play five, so yeah. Yeah, exactly, that's fucking crazy. Oh, No, but shit. I think, I think with, um, um, like, when you're a streamer, I think you can kind of, I don't know, like, create your own schedule, I think. So you're not really attached to going to the office at like 10 a.m. and then leaving at X. Um, yeah, like I mean, it depends what you again, do. You know, like like for example, like for for me, like because I do all the LEC and LCS games, right? Like I'm like kind of like married to that schedule. Like if MSI is on, I'm starting every single day at eight, and then I'm like out at two. So I think that I like like especially during Worlds, I think it gets pretty hard because that starts being like three a.m. wake ups and stuff. So yeah, yeah, but you don't have to do that. Like you do that because you want to yeah, do that. Cool. Yeah, and, that, and that's and that's like um, compared to playing in a competition where you're relying on your teammates to 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 come into practice every day mm -hmm. and play five solid games of, of training um while also you know being an example and playing well in solo queue and um you know in the end when it comes to best of fives and best of threes that you don't put all your you know you don't explode after you lose one best of five because this is what usually what happens people keep grinding keep grinding keep grinding then they get to playoffs then they lose one best of five. And they're like, "Oh my god! Now I have to go home. What do I have to do? My my life is over. I do. I'm so stressed." Like mm -hmm. people, it's just. I think it's just um, sometimes. Obviously, when you're in an environment that is very, very, very good, and like you're being pushed, and you're winning, and you're having fun, and all those ex aspects that make you a better player, and your your team as is getting better too, then it's it's honestly. It's fucking great because you love the game. You, you're growing. You're, you know, earning money. You are getting all the extras. You're getting new experiences, meeting new people. You're traveling. So it's like the ultimate thing for a pro. It's like the best case scenario. But then there's a middle ground, and there's like the some people you actually don't want to be around because they are kind of mm, unconsciously like sucking the energy out of you. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously, this has to. You have to just accept this, but I think uh, when you come into a new team every time you meet new players, um, for a player, it's not always that you get to know the people before you get to play with them. It's more like the, the teams just pick five people, they put them together, and then it's like, oh, it's a, it's, it's a flip. Unless you are Team Liquid and you spend 10 million on the best players in the world. Mm -hmm. So it's just... Uh, Even that just has had a, problems. You know, it hasn't been something where they yeah, yeah. that that it's always seamless. So, but yeah. yeah, just like spending a lot of time with other people, pretty much six days a week because this is the schedule, um, is very frustrating if you don't know how to to deal with it, and especially if you're losing a lot. You know, mm -hmm. some people don't care, but the real competitors they will get mad and they will push themselves and they will get angry, and they will fight. You know. Yeah, I I think that it just becomes. Uh, the type of thing where people need to start doing more like research on personalities and, and things like that. And what is going to actually uh, fit together instead of just having this mentality that the best players in each position is always going to yield the best team. I feel, I feel like in general, that's something that has been kind of like thrown by the wayside after, you know, some teams have had success. It seems like the idea of building teams actually with the idea of like, how are the players are going to complement each other has been pretty much lost. Um, 
a long yeah. way. And I, I remember. I actually the... think, though, by the way, that's part of what those coaches like. They're t they're not really knowing they're doing it, but they're actually admitting they're not that great coaches when they say all that stuff. Though, don't like, I want to be able to mold them all. It's like that's also part of the skill of a coach. Like, in, I know it's not a big thing as much in like American sports because you all think it's about like the X's and O's, but basically in European soccer, football. Like the whole concept of being a manager often isn't just tactics. It's called man management. It's like, how do you deal with the personalities? How do you get the big ego guy who was on a better team to play well? Do you get the young guy not to be cocky? Like that's a job of a coach. So in my opinion, that should be a massive deal. You shouldn't just be putting five players like, well, this is the best top player I can no. get in the jungle. It's like, no. well, how are they going to work together? Do they even have personalities that will make sense? Mm -hmm. Like that would be an obvious example where like that's again why people like Forgiven have had such a hard career because in theory you should actually take points off the person if you know they're going to be a difficult teammate and they're going to maybe fuck a rookie's game up etc like the skill in the server shouldn't be just all that matters in that scenario you should take that into account for sure yeah uh, it, it's it's tough I mean I remember uh, personally that was one of the, the things that I thought was one of the biggest reasons why the, those curse and TL teams that I was on never really succeeded is there was always just this mentality of getting the best player in every position um, and there was never any like inherent synergy between the players or there was nothing that was like, uh, that, that brought us together, right? Where when you take other teams and you look at how they're formed, I mean, I don't think it needs to go as far as CLG where every player is, is best friends with everyone. And, like everyone just yes. has that mentality. But I think that there was, there was, there's something to be said for like players actually like knowing each other, liking each other, like being able to communicate, like having some type of like similar, like cultural fits like i feel like that's something that is that uh, always held us back personally so clg I went the opposite way didn't they because they did like the one way, way like, too oh, much friends wait look we got a glue guy and another glue guy and another glue guy and another glue we've got five glue guys yeah he's stuck outside the fucking playoffs aren't you so how did that work out like didn't we did it you have to actually have some good league of legends players as well but why, why have you done the opposite that's why i agree with you actually Dom. that clg team is a bit like the immortals team it's like where's the carries like, what is this team I mean, like if you actually took the clg and dig lives and just merge them together you could probably make like two good teams yeah probably i think that um to be more specific like in terms of how this would actually work in game and like outside of the game if you have one guy that's like super positive and like never fefs and um you know, kind of is, is 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 working like that. Then you also need a guy that's like super negative, or like maybe I should say the other way around, where you have a super negative guy. You will need a, a, a positive you guy. That, yeah. Yeah, you need a reality that, check. That will, you know. that will not, you know, uh, get super negative too when yes. this guy gets negative. And then it's the same if you have um, a guy that's really good at late game, for example, or playing mid late game. Then you need a guy that's they need two other guys that are really good and aggressive in mid in early mid because. If you don't have that, then you will get Steam Gold in early game, and it's it it's actually that it actually that simple, like how I explained it. Yeah, for sure. I was I was gonna ask uh, your perspective on on LEC because this is the first um, split like since I mean, since you're in NA that you are outside of LEC, but even when you're in NA, I mean you're competing in another like tier one league or supposed tier one league, I guess I should say. So there's gonna be a lot of focus put on that. I assume that now you had more time to actually watch LEC um, from the outside, and I'm sure that when you're in LEC, there's like a different perspective with G2 like winning all the time. They feel almost probably fucking unbeatable. Um, but now, like, we actually saw, you know, Mad Lions uh, beat them and just, like, how did it feel watching LEC from the outside? What was your, like, idea of these teams? Were you surprised that G2, like, actually ended up doing so poorly this split? Like, what were your, your main takeaways? Um, well, I think that for, G for Rogue and Mad, they've impressed me the most because I could clearly see, like, a learning curve. So that tells that, you know, they're their uh, their organization is doing a good job in terms of making their players better and providing them what they need and it's showing in game so that's really nice to see that other people and orgs are you know becoming better um meanwhile i think g2 has just been a very very stale and trying to kind of expand everything that they do and they want to have like 20 million different strategies it feels like mm -hmm. meanwhile they could just you know try to master more actually their strengths but I think that also comes from having a new player. And um, who else was in the top? Who was else in the top three? I mean, uh, was uh, so it's Rogue, Mad Lions, G2, and then Schalke. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think Schalke also has uh, a lot of players that are very hungry. It's just nice to see players that are, you know, really focused and they put all their time and effort into, you know, they're very, they're driven, you know? Like, it's nice to see players just succeed and not see the same 
I mean, I wouldn't mind seeing G2 win the next 10 years every game either, because then they probably deserve it, right? Mm -hmm. But um, I think it was just a matter of time before they they got outworked, and it's just showing that they are getting outworked, and some people are bored of winning, I think, which is natural too. Sure. I actually think, by the way, you know when G2 won MSI and everyone was saying, like, this changes everything, now everyone will think it's possible, like, which I think is, like, they overblew that story a little bit. But one thing I think is really good about G2 not winning this split and, quite frankly, not even making the final is that, remember the talk in the off-season? It was like, oh, this is boring. Yeah, they're ruining now the G2, league. Now G2 can't lose because they've got every best player. It's like, that isn't the game right now. Like, what's funny is... If, like, even if Rogue had won, they didn't have all the best players. Like, that Trimby guy was up and down all over the place. Like, Hans Armour mm -hmm. got better maybe as the split went on. Like, then Mad Lions won. And, like, I don't think they even vaguely had all the best players. Like, that banter Perks had to cars, he was sort of true. Like, mate, you just fuck, you were reckless. You were just fucking watching someone win the LEC and going, I did it as well. And it's like, yeah, sure you did. So, and, like, put your fucking drawing on the fridge, you daft card. But anyway, like, in this scenario, I think it's good because it shows that, like, what you're saying here, it ain't about, like, your name or the fact that, in theory, you're the, all the best players. Players. Like the game now is going to be about how well do you work together? Like what strategic plan do you have? Are you actually outworking the guy who's got a bigger name? If you do, then you could you can actually win the LEC over him now. That's a really positive sign. You don't have to be the team that has the most money. Like, listen, Rogue has very good players, but like some of those players are just locked in a contract. Like they don't you don't have to have the best players. It's nonsense. That's that's total nonsense. We don't need to do that anymore. Yeah, I think it's crazy because <laughs> normally when you look at a team that wins, there's at least a few players that you're like Okay, this guy is the best player in their position. I thought, I, did any Mad Lions player actually make the old pro like first team? I, I have no clue if they, they made it. Because surely El Yoya can't have been ahead of Inspired. So I'm guessing probably none did if I had to look it up. Yeah, I'm I, pretty I would sure they wouldn't I, have. I would assume none of them did either, especially because it's regular split award. Wait, wait, wait. But like, who who Ka on Mad? Kaiser, I think. Oh, Kaiser. Yeah, oh, I mean Kaiser could have, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess I guess Kaiser could have potentially done it, but like, who on uh, Mad Lions would you say is actually like the best in their position outside of Kaiser? Right? Like, even Humanoid. Humanoid's the name. Like, he's the one that that carried that that fucking last playoff sure. series, right? But how many people actually believe that Humanoid is a better player than Caps at this point within Europe? Nobody. Yeah. Nobody. That's Come the on. thing. So it, it's actually crazy. Well, I mean, what I was what I was kind of getting at, um, what I was asking for Biven is like, do you think that it's more Mad Lions and Rogue overcoming the hurdle, or do you think that G two actually was like a much weaker version of themselves because of like the fact that they changed a player, um, and they didn't like hone in strategies, or maybe like a little bit of both? What was your mentality around like what happened within Europe the split? I think it's um, just a matter for G2. I think they are just too relaxed. Like, obviously, they have won so much, right? So, um, bringing in a new player, which considered by community, it's also, I don't know if it was people think it's an upgrade, but it's still you get reckless in your team. So, the players are probably like, okay, this guy will just carry late and he will, you know, never int and he will just be the backbone. And uh, he did carry a lot of games, but in the end, uh, it's a it's a playoff series, right? You 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 have to play well as a team in a best of five, and it can go one way or the other. I think obviously they are still very very good, um, but um, I think it's just it's silly to define a team on a best of five. What I said earlier, they probably didn't play their best strategies, mm -hmm. um, which karma. <laughs> Carmo which probably minutes. like which probably they would have if they didn't win twenty thousand million games in a row because then they would have been like okay from game one we're gonna you know we're gonna smash them yes. and we're not gonna tr we're not gonna try to play our C comp in the first game because we will not show it because we will beat them anyways and then we can show that in the finals for example yes. right and this is how teams like G two think uh, Caps is not gonna play Seraphine in the first game because he knows if he picks uh, Oriana he will just win the game anyways and then. You know, he's saving picks for playoffs since day one of, of, of Spring Split. And this is a very big strength they have. It's the same with uh, the rest of the team. They have really big champion pools. Um, so I think they still have the ability to you know, be the best team and win everything. They have showed that. Uh, it's just that the other guys, I think, uh, are more, a little bit more hungry. And um, yeah, it's just, that's, it's just, taking over i think and uh it's not like they're outclassing them or anything like in a very high level it's very close still yeah i mean i, I think i think the thing that's, that's interesting is i i kind of am 
uh, questioning how Reckless must think. I feel like he must feel a lot like upset where he joins a team that's been like relatively successful or more successful than he has been in like the last few years. Joins it, expects things to go well, and then when the results like don't come, you start to assume naturally that you must have been the problem because you're the only thing that changed. So, like from your perspective, like did you think that it was going to be a seamless transition? Did you think that Reckless was going to be good enough to just fit in, or like from having played with him, did you think that there was going to be issues? Because I know that you're also familiar with Perks and like what he brings to a team, um, and obviously he's known to be a lot more vocal uh, and be more, much more of like a leadership figure, um, than reckless. Like, did you think that this was going to have as much of an effect as, as it did have within G2 or what was your perception heading into the season? I think in terms of in-game skill, I think they're very, um, very similar. They're very like both their top class players, right? So there's not much to say about their play. They will barely have bad games. They will always carry, um, the games that they're, you know, they're always playing well. I think the difference comes in the, in the yeah exactly said like the leadership part like maybe Perks would have been the guy that said we're doing this strategy tomorrow and we're gonna you know beat them from game one, mm-hmm. and we're gonna play our best strat. Meanwhile, Reckless is like okay, I'm just gonna I can play Karma here. I can just um, you know I think uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna let you carry caps uh, because you are you're insane, which he is, and just like have more like laid back approach, you know. And this is. Um, um, I think this is the clutch, like the clutch things in the best of fives, right? It's like comes down to one, two, three games, four or five games. And uh, it's just the mindset coming in and how decisive are you and how bad do you want to win? And uh, not saving your best for last, you know? Yeah, I just feel like in the position, it must be really hard for Reckless to come in to a team that's been winning, that's been beating him and then being the one telling them like how they should play. That would seem like that would be a very like hard thing to do. Like like oh, imagine it's totally understandable. Yeah, of course. Yeah, like imagine like right now you were just put in in a position like this where you joined like Rogue tomorrow and the team's been successful. The team has been more successful than teams that you've been on recently, and now you have to like try to like ignore all that history and then just like in the moment rise above and like you know kind of like coach those types of players or just have that much of a voice. It must seem like really impossible. So. I mean, I don't no, know. I think I don't know how you, how you I, do that as a player. I think that um, I think you have to come in with a with a very open mind. You can't come in with like I'm just gonna follow and do everything that they are doing because they have won every game, right? Obviously, people still make mistakes, and I think this is where it becomes important when um, that you are aware of everything that's happening. So even if you're G2 and you're winning every game, there's probably still things that I would see if I would play with them or the same with Rogue. That I would question, I would not mm-hmm. criticize it, but I would just question it. And as a veteran, you have so many, like so much experience that you have played in so many different teams, that um, even the best teams can do things better. And I'm not the type of guy that's just gonna sit there and you know let myself get carried. I'm gonna, I can feel in my in my hands, I can feel it in my body when something is off mm-hmm. that we shouldn't be doing as a team, and then I will bring that up compared to like just sitting there and sucking it in and just letting my team do whatever, yeah. even though things go wrong, you know? Uh, for this, like the, I'll give you, oh, sorry. Did you finish point? It's just like a more natural, like, uh, I feel like it's just in- instinct for me, you know? Like, I can't, I can't accept the fact that a mistake is being made and then this is not being um, questioned or improved on because this is how you just stagnate. Because yeah. basically, I mean, Reckless actually did say some stuff like this. Basically, I think it was on his stream or something mm-hmm. like you know that he thought that like exactly what Dom's saying. Like, yeah, um, I was losing to them, therefore they must like so you know like, know how to play, and then I should just do whatever they say. It's like the problem with that logic is it's actually the reason I told everyone in the off season why I didn't actually like the move for Reckless specifically. Like, I like the move for G two. It's the best possible play you can get to replace Perks. It's the best it is role, and in theory, if everyone plays their role correctly, you're gonna win the league. But the reason why for Reckless I didn't like it is because it did feel like well I can't beat them, so I'll just join them. Right, that's a terrible mentality because, like, in fact, I think it was Peter Don made a comment like this on Twitter where he said, like, like something like good players, you know, want to like stack the roster that they're on. A great player, it's like you want to just beat people with who you have. You I, think, I think it's something better. like, like, 
any roster you join becomes like a great yeah, roster. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, great way of saying it. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. You feel it, right? The fact that I'm on the team is what's going to make us have a chance to win. So the point is, if I'm reckless in that scenario, they didn't bring you in just because you are just like, ah, oh, just you can just be the worst player and then we'll maybe we'll let you win. Like if they just wanted someone to just play just only like a normal AD carry and then all the solo lanes, they'd have got like Kobe or someone who's done that their whole career, someone who's like a specialist at that. If you bring in Reckless, someone who has been the MVP many times, someone where Fnatic every time they had problems after the Caps team used to just have to have like a panic mode where they had to play through Reckless and, and that would win again so. and they would get right back in the playoffs, they'll be really good again. What he should have done, in my opinion, is understood. They're bringing me here to be a star as well. That's why yeah, they got me. So if yeah, I'm exactly. reckless, I have to communicate to my teammates. Listen, you guys might have won without me, but guess what? That team isn't here anymore. So here's what I need to carry the game. Here's what, and then I tell you what. The reason why I say that as well is because it's it's one thing if the other players had been in like godlike form, like the old team. Like let's say Wonder and Caps having the best split ever, then you could just chill as reckless and maybe you win. But when you saw how that split was going in the playoffs, yeah, yeah, that's when you had to. You had to have yeah, a mode there where it's like, listen, let's stop fucking around. You guys were the best yeah, last year, that, but yeah. I, I could carry this game now. So give me the setup, give me the peel, give me everything, give me and I'll carry these team fights. Yeah, you want that? He would, but I think it would have worked. Yeah, I do. I don't think that he is flexible enough, and he knows how to play for the team, and he knows how to carry. I think it's just like a mindset thing that you have to switch on, you know, and being like adaptable, depending on how your teammates are playing. If your top side is mm-hmm. Giga Griffin, then. A really driven player, really good player with a lot of achievements will want to carry and will force that um, because he knows that it will work. Yeah, I, I think the, the the thing that becomes like really difficult is the fact that it is G2, right? Like G2 has been a team where they've done like so many, like they, they have that like charm where they will run it down in a lot of situations and it's almost like you don't believe that they're actually like trying you're like, oh, well, they're just kind of having fun. It's G2, you know, like they'll, they'll be informed when it matters. So I feel like the reality probably hit way too late for Reckless. And it's like, oh shit, we're going to fucking lose. Like, I'm going to have to carry this game or we're fucked. Like, that's the situation. Because I assume that he just thought like, yeah, I mean, come playoffs, like come the games that actually matter. Caps is going to be the best mid laner. Yankos is going to be the best jungler. Like, I'm going to be just like able to just do my part. And my teammates are all going to just perform like the best in their roles. Because, I mean, that's what pretty much everyone thought, right? Going in, so... I feel like that's the thing that becomes so hard when you join a team like G2 is the fact that they have that level of like, of like rapport where you know that they're always going to win when it matters, that it it might not feel surreal. It might feel like you're overstepping boundaries if you're being like really critical of your teammates play because you assume that they're just going to be able to fix their own problems. Like if people don't know, Upset is actually the player who basically has the opposite reputation in the scene. His reputation is off. He comes to the team like, yeah, I have to have all yeah. the resources. You must play around me. Give me the champions. Like the point is, you don't want to be like a total extreme on either end. Like I actually think it was appropriate for Upset this split. Like look at the, the way the rest of the team collapsed. But like that's the point is like you should be able to, in theory, if you're going to be in the team to fit whatever that is going to make the team win this game. You know, and these players could all do both these styles. Of course they could. Look how fucking fantastic they are. It's just mentality. That's it. It's tough. I mean, since yeah. we sp- spoke about upset earlier, I would love to hear like your take on what you think the problems within Fnatic without like revealing anything like too deep. Um, like what you what you thought the reasoning was for Fnatic's like failure? Because I mean, they're another team that theoretically like should have at least like side grade or at least be like in in second place um, within LEC. And yeah, I mean, it's it's probably the same situation where. It felt like everything that the players did that worked. It's, it seemed like Fnatic would always have that like crazy over aggression, but they would be able to ta- to like taper it off enough that when they got into like big matches and playoffs, they were able to beat like all the other teams outside of G two. Like they they knew how to be aggressive without like running it down. So like how how do how do you think that like this team ended up, up failing when theoretically I mean Niski and Upset were playing the best on that team. I think uh, from observing. The, the scrims and watching them play on uh, on stage, I think it was always very... Wait, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Nothing my happened. phone just... Yeah, okay. So the, it was always like watching a Fnatic game, it's like, you don't know what's going to happen. It's always a flip. And it was kind of the same watching their scrims. I think there was not enough... Like there should have been more responsibility taken by... Um, everyone in the team. I think there was very, I think when you put a group like this together, everyone kind of expects everyone to be very good and everything to go very natural. And you don't have to tackle so many problems. You don't have to go back to basics, which they did. Um, obviously over aggression, right? Because they 
Mm -hmm. they, they have players together. that like they run it down together like extreme crazy like for example one guy wants to go in and the other guy doesn't and then they just the, the, that the, that one guy doesn't is not willing to bounce and he's still going in because he wants to prove a point that he should that the guy should have went in with him <laughs> and um it's just the 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 ability to sacrifice for one another i think they didn't have this capability and it was uh, um i guess not implemented um which kind of a shame because i think with a few changes in in terms of like how these players operate they uh, could actually like be s super good because they like they can be the top teams but they will always lose they will also lose against the worst teams so you just create this imbalance where every time you go in a game it's just like you are you're just not sure, you know, what's going to happen or how your teammates are going to play. And this was just uh, a byproduct of, of their scrims and, like, um, how they ended up performing in real games. But, uh, yeah, as I said, it's uh, it's a shame because they have insane players. And I can see that uh, they just need a little bit more um, guidance and people need to take... Um, I don't know, they need to want it more, you know? Like, yeah. you, you need to want to win... Uh, you need to want to be the best. Like you can't just, you can't just say it and it will be, it happen. You, know, you need to feel it. You need to come into the day with energy. You need to um, tell tell your teammates, "Oh, sorry, my bad." Even though it was the other guy's mistake, you know. Like you need to take ownership and yeah, be responsible. There was, um, but generally, this is uh, very lackluster in uh, in 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 many teams, and this is uh, something that is not teached. This is. Uh, as I said, the coaches, they don't have much, much, maybe they do have knowledge, but they're not able to present it to, to players or players are not able to take the feedback and grow because obviously it's very, very stressful. Like you have six days of practice and then if someone is going to tell you how to be a better human being, then some people like they just want to play the game, you know, they yes. just want to have fun. They don't want to be bothered by, by telling like, having a coach tell you that you should have said my bad when it was actually your teammates bad be just because of like the habit you create in the sure. in the long run you know mm -hmm. this goes back to what we were talking about earlier there's another factor that people do not factor in when they're picking players up and it's actually something I'll tell you right now during the off season when it was initially before there was even a rumor but when it when basically I was talking to Jack from Cloud9 a bit when he basically told me like I have this opportunity where I could get perks and we were like going back and forth on what the pros and cons are because obviously it was going to cost like an insane amount of money and basically if you know the way the economics of League of Legends work you'll never make that money back from the player like you just basically what you're saying is I just want to win if you sign that player and one of the factors I said is like don't even just look at the in-game aspect the thing with perks is he's bringing all these extra qualities that could make another player better on the team or could get you another player in the future like these are qualities that like they don't exist they're called intangibles they're just concepts yeah, of how exactly. we model people but like I, if i say they're real it'll be like a, a like a redundant comment because they're obviously not real as i said they're intangibles but like basically you can feel the effect of those and so if you don't mm -hmm. count factor those in i think there's a lot of teams where what you're talking about basically is a lot of teams are just good players but there's no leader there's no coherent mm -hmm. philosophy that they all agree upon like i'll give you a quick example when i said in my reflections interview with mithy like i referenced him in a question as like and obviously you were like one of the great shot callers and captains or whatever he was like no i'm not I'm, I'm not a shot caller. Why do you say I'm a shot caller? And I was like, well, I mean, everyone who's played with you says you're like a genius and that. And he was like, no, I'm not. I'm just, all I would do is I would just get all five players to do the same thing at the same time. It's like, fuck it. Are you trying to like mind fuck me or something? <laughs> that is shot calling and leading. Like, yeah. listen, you're so genius. You make your, your teammates think that you're not the leader, but they all after their career go, yeah, he basically taught me everything about the game. Like that's actually being a leader, yep. but that's a mad underrated quality because it doesn't show. It's why I, an example I know a lot of fans didn't understand is this split even when that Trimby guy was doing well, I said, mate, the one move I wish they hadn't done is bring him in. Because if they had that team, but they keep Vander, mate, Vander can be a captain. He's a guy with massive experience. He's a guy who's played, guess what, people like Forgiven, great players, very spicy players, rookie players. Like, 
the experience someone like that could add to a team that's a lot of young players like that's worth more than someone who's slightly better at support right now mechanically you know to me like i think i think we're weighing different things up where someone goes it has to go with the upgrade here because you upgraded maybe like the potential skill level of the player but you what did he lose that's my question so in my yeah. opinion once you identify people have like captain qualities like just like perks like he doesn't have to be his mechanical best what he can bring to the team can make you win even without that mm -hmm. yeah yep definitely okay. Are you oh. trying to be that type of player, Feverman? Do you think you've got um, that in yet? I mean, I think I've gotten to a point where I don't really need to think too much like about what I do in game. It's just all become very natural, so that means that I can focus more on those aspects that you're talking about. Yeah, for example, making that positional call that we need to take for Drake, you know, or like uh, resetting on time because we will else lose map control. You know, I think it's just clicking your skills. Like doing an Oriana combo or pressing your TF cards and wave clearing, that's just normal, you know? It's just uh, a matter of navigating the map and making mm -hmm. sure your team is comfortable, making sure you are decisive when you need to be decisive, when you need to take responsibility and, uh, you know, take ownership of, of your whole team. I mean, I was gonna, I was gonna ask you based off this. So there was something I was, I'm gonna ask you afterwards, but right now this just pop, popped into my head. Uh, like when you when you relook at like last season with Misfits, what do you when you like try to analyze yourself? Like what what do you think specifically were things that you like failed at as a player or like being able to like lead that team in terms of like getting the team to to improve to a level where they were able to like compete in playoffs and things. I think that um, during the time in Misfits, I didn't realize how much I was pushing um, my jungler when he was uh, very, he was not in a situation where he could take that. So then he rookie. would, yeah. he, he, he like shut down in a way almost. Like I was the only guy in the room that was saying, guys, I actually think, and you remember this in the beginning of the year, I was saying, I, guys, I, I'm here because I want to win the whole thing. I believe we can win the whole, whole thing. If I don't believe that, then I will not be sitting here and I won't be playing. And uh, the other guys were like, oh, I just want to make playoffs. I want to win the rookie of the season, blah, blah, blah. So then um, obviously the work ethic is very different and I am pushing someone who has never been pushed before and is getting i'm criticizing him and questioning him when we're losing games in the weekend um while he's very frustrated and cannot kind of deal with that but then also i am thinking like okay we are right now we are like eight eight we have or i don't know it was like very close score we were like seven seven and then we need to really need to win the games to get into playoffs right so mm -hmm. then naturally i start pushing more and more and more because that's what i do but then other people, they they cannot be they cannot learn when they're stressed, and I didn't really um, understand my teammates fast enough where I could be like, okay, this is what the guy needs right now. He needs me to tell him you actually did a good job. Yes. Um, let's keep doing this, and I will try to take more responsibility. And I just want you to trust me, and I want you to follow me. But instead, I would be putting responsibilities on others, obviously also on myself, because I felt like the we were not gonna make it if we mm -hmm. if we wouldn't change something. So just I something just became very clear, but I wasn't able to 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 handle it. Properly. Sounds like you were, you were asking of him what you would ask of yourself. Like if I was in the shit, like I've got to push myself, we got to make it now. But maybe he needed, like you said, maybe he needed the pat on the back and like, don't worry, we're going to make it. It's going to be good. Yeah, be exactly. great it's the so Dale Carnegie sure. book. That's like one of the main concepts yeah. of that book overall is like, how do you influence different people with different mindsets to get the results you want? Yes. Like without like just because every person is different, right? So it's like, how do you get the results that you want from from people? Yeah, it's super fucking hard to do. Like, oh, it's, it's one of the hardest skills to learn because it's, it's an entire skill yeah. set. Like you're saying, Dom, you need to read it. books on it and stuff. Like yeah. I had the same thing. I'll give you a quick example. Last year, when I was working with this Counter Strike tournament, where I was basically like in charge of all the broadcast stuff, like I could decide who I hire as my analyst. I could tell them between the breaks, I want you to do it this way. I could be like the director, sort of, right? On the one hand, that was awesome. 
But I naively thought, because I'd never done that role before, I used to basically just be the analyst on camera, which I was doing as well. Well, that's like being the star player, right? Well, if I'm the star player, then yeah, all I've got to tell you guys is like, right, just give me the ball, get out my way in this situation, like throw it to me if you don't know what you're doing. Like I can, I can handle it. I've got that world mapped out, but I'd never been the boss before. So what I didn't know was when I would see someone, particularly if like someone, the producer fucked up like a segment, like he put the, he like, he took the camera off me when it's like, I was obviously about to make like a point and then like he showed like a shot where it was like the other guy and you don't hear me saying that in those scenarios i would just unfortunately i would just see the obvious mistake and instead of being like it turns out what he should have done was being like look i liked when he did do this thing right and, like you sort of just stack it like you stack three or four things they did well that you want him to keep doing and then you find a way the to compliment sort of like, sandwich <laughs> you, you carefully ask them to do something you have to keep <laughs> ask them what i was doing basically was i would just tell him like i would say to myself spit in their face. I, yeah i would just tell him like like that, that's unacceptable like what are you doing like when you do that you make me look bad like you th- mess up the show like if you do that again are you gonna fuck the whole segment up like how can i work with you in this scenario so and some, that's not, some people I, take, can take that yeah most and that what i learned though is uh, some of these guys couldn't though like that was the problem no, and i didn't know it because here's another thing maybe you found me which is why i'm bringing this point up they wouldn't say it to my face though they would just take it like oh okay yeah yeah i'll do it better but i didn't it turns out like those guys actually like if anything they're like, they not only weren't gonna, they're <laughs> only were gonna do it yeah they were just thinking like fuck i just hope he doesn't come up here again that's it like they weren't they weren't taking it like i hope they were because the point is if someone had said that to me that's my personality yeah i would be like yeah i'll level my shit up like don't worry yeah i've got you next time don't worry i didn't realize it was the opposite effect though and crucially one thing that mm-hmm. is so key as a leader but you don't think about it sadly is you think to yourself well why would i give him all compliments on stuff that's just his job like unfortunately that's what the people need they need yeah. to feel like you appreciate them you think that they have i was thinking well that's his job like, he shouldn't have to do the things in the segments like that's why i'm yeah. saying it's a, it's a totally new field and you have to sort of like learn on the fly like you no, no, you can't just in last saying you re- can read books but there's no book that does has all the secrets in immediately it's like techniques you have to build up you know mm-hmm. did you find this I mean, I think it's very, very hard to, because everyone is so different, right? Like everyone is their own individual and everyone needs something different. And one guy needs to be complimented and the other guy actually needs to be flamed to oblivion Mm -hmm. for that person to get something like out of them, you know, even if it's like a small little of improvement. And I think just being able to identify that in, in people, what um you you need for from them in order to progress you know and get better results you you need to you need to question them and you need to criticize them or you need to compliment them you need to find a way to find to make them better because in a competition if you don't do that you will stagnate and other people will do that so it's just a matter of who wants it more and yeah i mean i, I think the like, thing that's also being lost is like the amount of pressure that you're under it's so much harder to do this when you're under the amount of pressure you're yeah, under yeah, when yeah. you're in lec or lcs or like any of these premier mm-hmm. competitions because like there is like just the personal stress of like hey i have to play every weekend in front of hundreds of thousands of people like and, I, and I want to look what good happens. yeah of course yeah of course yeah, exactly and, like, it, it reflects on your whole career like if Yes. Other people underperform and don't do their jobs. Like a lot of the fans can't see like a lot of the things. If your jungler suddenly is not warding for you as a mid laner and you have to play differently or you get killed a hundred times, like it could be you that ends up getting crucified for yes. other people's mistakes. So like having to rely on people and, and all that stuff, it just makes it so much more difficult than just the overall concepts of like Think about doing this. it from the outside. If that split goes badly, no one's going to go Rezox a failure. They're going to go, look, he was he started pretty well. He's got potential for the future. But I tell you what, when they have a conversation just about Febivan, they are going to say, well, if he's that good, why wasn't he in playoffs? Like, oh, I thought you said he was like a, one of the top players. Get that, that for sure. Like, there's a different, there's different stakes and pressure at play there. But, but that's why I, I agree with you, Dom. I think it can like, basically, it it can make you think like, you, got, you have to share some of that pressure with that guy. But like, in a way, what you need to do is like convince him to help you, you mm-hmm. know? Yeah. It's crazy. So the second question I wanted to ask you was about coaching, because I, I assume that you're from like the same school of thought where like, if you're a player and you play this game at a high level for um, a, like a long term, you're essentially going to have more game knowledge than most coaches. You're going to have a better understanding of like what should happen in the games. It's like why you're a pro player. Um, so what do you really value within like a coach? Like, what do you think a coach should be doing um, for a team? Or like, what is the thing that is most valuable um, in your perspective for a coach to be contributing to a team? Because like, it's not going to be just teaching the players how to play the game in most situations. So what exactly like is the coach supposed to do to get the most out of you? I mean, it's very hard, very hard. Yeah, question. we're putting the hard questions to you, man. Like, I don't know. 
Other ones were like, hey, uh, so like, what did you eat today, Jet? And then for based you, based on like, what you said earlier, it sounds like you. Are, I mean, you've sort of implied that you you want someone who will challenge you, right? Like sometimes you want the coach to actually not just be like, oh, either just do it like this, or you're you're the best. That you want them to kind of bring it out here, right? Yeah, of course. I mean, for coaching, I think um, again, it's 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 individual. Like it's specific, right? Everyone. Um, I think in a team setting. Um, you need to have like you need to make progress as a coach like for the team like for the five guys together and you need to implement i think um good habits um you know good 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 morals just um creating a system where people actually are improving on a daily basis um from day one and people are taking it serious and they are um if one guy is not driven enough then the other guy has to you know you know make up for that and you know push that way and i think like individually i think there can be a lot of coaching done uh depending on on on, on the person um one guy needs his coach to sit with him and ask him questions about um whatever like i don't know his, his solo queue games or like uh, his personal life or he needs to notice that something is off um he needs to try to connect the, the, the bot lane a little bit more. He needs to talk to them and try to figure out, like, how can I make these two guys that are not really communicating that much, how can I, you know, m make them have more fun or, like, make them want to work together better? Or, um, for example, for me or for a rookie, teaching the importance of um, of, of their body, like uh, exercising and uh making it important is like what, what what they're eating and just like those small things that make the guys think that will make them improve in the long term while obviously not pushing them too hard because as you said this very stressful environment so people don't really take it well and they need to usually people reflect after the season but just pushing a little bit like trying to make the, like the pieces work together a little bit better um obviously trying to teach the game um, in a way where people don't feel like that this guy knows everything because usually when you're a pro you should have more game understanding than a coach that has not been a pro before and I just think um, being very open-minded to, to, to trying stuff but also when something is clearly not working that the players uh, are trying or they have gotten freedom that the coach wanted them to have um, being able to tackle that and like um, completely s switch, you know, like you don't want a coach to be too soft and you don't want him to be too strict. It just depends piece by piece, but you need to have like a, a, a base, you know, mm -hmm. at least this is how I would um, coach my team if I would ever coach a team, but I, I don't think that I would. Um, I, I don't know. I, I just, um, it's just hard to, to, I would, the only way I would coach a team is if I would really know those guys before I would coach them. Like I would mm -hmm. never go into a team and just flip it with the, with five random guys, you know, yeah. because you might end up working with three guys that, um, but may maybe this is also because I'm a competitor now and I'm like, I have the mindset that I need to win everything and that I want to be the best player. I think if I, if I switch to like having a mindset, like, I need to be really patient with this player and we're probably not going to win everything, but this guy is going to grow like month by month by month. Is that actually worth my time? You know? So I just think I would have to go into a different mindset depending on the people you work with. And uh, it sounds very, very, very stressful with what I've seen uh, yep. in players over the years. Yeah, for sure. And it like the other thing is it, it, no one really knows what you're doing so the the whole problem is the perception of the players based like it's just compared to the results and if there's any difference positive or negative from what the expectation is to what the results are then it just ends up being like what what they deem is like the coach's difference right so like if you're on a team that's supposed to be like really fucking good and then the team ends up underperforming regardless of if the players are actually just bad you know i mean like the players could just actually not be great in their role anymore. But if the perception is that they're great players and they don't get the results, then you're just a bad coach. And that's like what you have to live with. So I feel like that's the hardest part is there's no actual way for people to evaluate 
what you do, but you'll always be like super evaluated and be under like intense scrutiny by even people like your GM and stuff. So it's not even just like the public, it's within your own organization. I think it's really Tom, I've got a question yeah. for you, Bit. If in like, it. let's say two or three years, you've done the streaming thing for a while, as you say, because you're trying to do like, not as bad as LS's schedule, but you try to do like the live view. And so you are to some degree still tied to the games. You have to watch. In a few years, if so, if you got like a nice offer, I'm talking like good pieces, nice money, a few million dollars a year, you want to be a coach? Sounds to me like you're sort of drifting in that direction. Yeah, definitely. You doing. Definitely. I, th I think so. Because I think that there's like uh, an amount of like fulfillment that you can get out of a coach that's like being different than, than streaming, right? Like as a streamer, you know, I can say, I can like, uh, for, like, what's the most validation I get? Oh, should I predict a champion or a team's going to do really well? And then they like, like no one else predicted it. And I fucking got it right. Oh shit. People are like, damn, he no, kind of knows no, the no, shit. No, like no, no. that's literally like, that's all the validation <laughs> that you sad. get as a streamer, you know? <laughs> like It feels so sad when you say this actually. Well, I mean, there's like other stuff. I mean, you, you like have like the fun, like own goals that you like hit. It's like, oh, like I want to have like certain follower account or like sub count. Like there's like your own goals, but those stop mattering over time. Once you realize it's like hit a point of like, kind of like absurdity compared to your own lifestyle. Right. So then you start just like wanting to like, have that experience right and it's like i i enjoy competing but i wouldn't want to compete as a player again like i, I don't even know if i'd be like good enough if i invested my time and i feel like what i could actually like contribute would be like yeah this type of stuff like if i came in with a really good mindset if i spent time but that's that's kind of like why i'm not even like doing something where it's like oh i want to like coach next year i want to literally like kind of like learn how to coach myself like read books think about yeah, the game like talk to other other people and that's part of the reason why like i have conversations on stream i also have conversations on off stream with with people that i really respect like peter dunn for example um and try to like learn about the game so i'm staying current but then also trying to like elevate the whole like idea of coaching so i mean it's something that's a long-term goal, goal of mine but yeah I, I do eventually want to coach yeah yeah it has to be an lec though dom this is a few years from now maybe you got to come to lec because the, the players like that you would be you would be able to fuck with that vibe i think a lot better than the lcs players yeah, maybe. Depends. I mean, I, I, I think it would just be, like, about the, the group of players. But, yeah, then the other thing is, like, I, I wonder how much, like, reputation, like, previous reputation would go into, like, how people perceive, like, you as a coach, you know? Like, if your player's like, oh, I, like, all I know about you is I saw some, like, clips on Reddit where you were getting a bunch of fucking hate. Like, what is, like, does that mean that you're, like, mentally unstable and not able to be a coach? It's like, I don't know, man. Like, I don't know if that would, like, be something that would, you know, harm people. But, I mean, I've, I've, I've like, you know planted seeds places for that to be a transition down the line we'll see though we'll see it's, it's hard to give up streaming because it feels like once you like once you jump away from from streaming for like any moment you like lose all your relevance within the scene the momentum of like where you built up and shit yeah, yeah of know, course so that's why that's why if people don't know that's another reason again we're not going to make a whole tangent because that episode had to be fucking memory hold but mm -hmm. that's one of the reasons i was also so mad about all that shit with ls because when I found out he wasn't even going to get the coaching job and he'd given up all these potential deals, I'm talking mm -hmm. there was like million dollar deals that was on the table. Like, like he worked for years to be in that position. He didn't get that just for what he did in 2020. He did that from the years he built up and kept doing crazy shit. So and that, it's the same as, that's an extreme version of what you're talking about, Dom. Like in that scenario, if you step away, you don't know in two years if you're going to have that again. Or who knows if you come back two years later, am I going to want to build up for three years again and go like... You, you kind of you will feel like you lost your spot i'm pretty sure i mean there's, there's something that i started doing like oh like i kind of used to have like a very like almost like delusionally positive mindset to everything that i went into in life like that was kind of just like how i i grew up or i would always just assume that things would go the best possible way like, like when i decided to be a pro because like, i ended up getting like lucky in a bunch of situations so like I like when I when I decided to like try to be a pro it actually worked out but now something that I try to do more that I actually learned from Weldon is really try to like assess all the different ways things could go so like let's say I join as a coach and I perform super well like obviously if I perform super well and my team is really good and then like I get good results then it's gonna be super fulfilling so then you try to like measure the fulfillment levels like what happens if I like join and like the team does well and I do and I do poorly. Like the team does well, so the perception is that I'm really good, but I actually like underperformed. What happens if like I underperform and the team does fucking terribly? Like you try to like evaluate all the the options and really like chart it in your head and just see like what is like your like what is your average? Like so out of all the things that could happen, like what is the like most reasonable scenario that could happen and is that most reasonable scenario going to be fulfilling which is one of the things that like in, in 2018 i was actually like really heavily deciding potentially come back like to the point where i was like talking to teams and stuff and like trying to like 
Um, I was going to like potentially play Academy for a split and then see if I could like play LCS again. And this is something that, that I actually like ended up doing that I realized it wasn't worth it because it's like the only way that it would have been good for me is like, I don't want to like ruin my fucking legacy or like my career or whatever, like people's perception of me was by like coming back and being fucking dog shit. Right. So it's like the only way it would have been fulfilling is if I come back and I win a championship and the likelihood of that, like if you try to join a team and like win a championship is super unlikely like as a player no matter how fucking good you are and that was the main reason why i decided not to do it is i was like there's only like one scenario where it really works out in my favor and every other scenario is not going to be fulfilling if i come back and i play well but my team isn't that good and i end up like middle of the pack like i'm not going to fucking be fulfilled by that because that was like essentially what my career was already so i think that that's just like something that i try to do more when i like weigh these types of options is try out all the possibilities and then kind of like see what i think is most reasonable this is the obvious segue feverman what is your motivation what are you what are you still playing for mate what are you still playing for i don't think i i don't uh i don't use motivation i think it's just like i think it's just the drive like i just try to always finish what i what i what i start and i try to uh, over the years, I realized the importance of, of growth, and uh, I have just not stopped. And uh, this is just pushing me and pushing me um, to like a limitless potential, kind of. That's how it feels. Holy shit, he's transcending like what human, <laughs> like yeah, Jesus. I know. He's, he is the step to transhumanism in esports. Like, yeah. he's going to have the first neural link. Or whatever that fucking yes. shit is, that, like was in a pig or whatever. Like, you know. <laughs> That's the most alpha answer possible. Like, geez, pretty what good. Were you, what yeah. were you expecting? Like, what is your that motivation, is Thorin? Obviously, I hoped he would say, like, you know, win the LEC one. I, like, I want to win LEC again, you know, and show that I wasn't. It wasn't yeah. just 2015. Win oh, worlds, you know. Like... I want to be the best player. And he just goes, I just want to uh, transcend this uh, humble mortal coil that we exist within <laughs> and become a pure, elevated level of spirituality and consciousness. At which point, all the galactic uh, intelligences and like, fucking all right. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. What's this, a fucking HP Lovecraft novel? Jesus you you realize we're still playing League of Legends here, Fabi, right? Like, <laughs> Listen, it's a nice ambition. It's fucking... But tell you what, if any coaches were watching, the awesome <laughs> this is my guy. He's trying to fucking really push the envelope. Yeah. There we go. What is what is, what is, what is your a- ambition, Thorne? I, I think if you said it before, like, you're trying to be, like, the best content creator possible, right? Like, that's just, like... Well, the thing is, I, I like, people don't know, unironically, I genuinely do exactly what I want almost every day. I do exactly the type. Like, think about it, right? One of the one of the reasons I became the historian is so that I didn't have to be trapped by what's going on now. Like, I don't have to talk about MSI today. I could do a video about anything. I could do a video about Feverman back when he was good. No, obviously it's a fucking joke, but you know, I could, do, you know, I could <laughs> really on, take in the time machine. You He's know, down and out. He's so down right now. It's, like, it was Jesus. an obvious banner. It's an obvious banner. Oh, no, that's man. the point. So by doing, because what I realized is this, I'll give you a very quick premise because we'll tie it into the theme of like people reading more books and trying to expand themselves. Right? I'll tell you a very, very good piece of advice that I saw about reading books. It's by this guy who's very famous on the internet now called Naval, right? Which is if you start reading a book and it's hard work, like you're not enjoying it, like oh, there's no way into it, like you're trying to get in doesn't matter, right, what you think about the book. Like, oh, but I, I want to have read, like, you know, some special book that people think I'm smart. Or, oh, I think this, I've heard it's good. Like, no, that's actually a sign that, like, you're not into the book. But I tell you what, if you find a book, could even be a trash book. If you start the book and in the first chapter you're hooked, it's easy to read then. You'll be looking forward to going to bed to read then. You won't have to make yourself. So same scenario. What I learned was I used to think I was lazy. I used to think in school, like, ah, oh, just do like the minimum. And I, No, what I learned was it didn't engage me mentally. But when I find stuff that engages me mentally, I could work, I could outwork any of you motherfuckers. I had a streak when I was doing that first show with Local, before it was this in Local, that one during Worlds, where fans don't know this, I had something like over 100 days in a row where I released a Thorin's Thoughts video. I didn't say a video. I released all my other shows as well and did live shows on local. I did over 100 Thorin Thoughts videos in a row while doing events. I was going to, like, Ukraine and then going up after the show and then doing a video. Like, in that scenario, like, because it, it was fun. I wanted to do the video. Like, it wasn't hard work to me. So I, I'm just trying to do the shit I do and then... Obviously, everyone wants growth, evolution, so you're trying to then make it the best you can be. And actually, I've always found, this is why I thought this episode would be good. I find it also interesting. This is something I learned very early in esports. If it's only about the game, well, then if the game's not interesting, there's nothing left. What you have to be able to do is look outside the game 
find something interesting and bring some of that back into the game. Some philosophy, something about the way a sports player played, something about like might be like a chess concept comes in how you understand macro. Like that is how you could basically what you bring to the table involves what you will get out of it. So that's like part of my philosophy. Basically. Yeah, and it's significantly more interesting. I mean, there's times where, you know, like I, I, I get the criticism sometimes with our show is that we don't talk about like the present enough. So like, I'm sure there's going to be people will be like, what? They didn't even talk about MSI day one. But it's like, what the fuck are we going to say? Oh, Dom one one is expected. Yeah. Oh, by the way, like, did you see how hard like uh, the, the Istanbul Wildcats threw to pain gaming? That was fucking crazy. What a throw, man. Like. At some point, there's nothing to really fucking talk about. Like, we all watch the fucking game. Like, you want to find things that are actually interesting yeah. that you can have, like, a real discussion on instead of just, like, kind of news recapping if what happened. If we wanted to hear someone talk about a bunch of games they didn't want to watch, we'd just listen to the LS segments on Face Check. <laughs> Come on, man. That's my show and you're flaming it. I'm fucking right here. No, I purposely didn't flame you, though. I just flamed the LS part. You know, who's also a friend of mine. <laughs> <laughs> All I'm saying is I don't believe LS genuinely enjoys watching LCS. I think he just does it for his job. That's there's the one I'll give you. The yeah, give I you. mean, like it's it, it's weird because it it's like I almost never like how I feel after watching LCS, but I always want to watch LCS. You know, like I'm always excited to watch the games, and then I'm disappointed by them, but then I'm equally excited the next day. I don't know what that says about me as a person that's also though because you're getting other things like you like the narratives as well you're also interested in the region the problem yeah. with ls is remember dude he can fall into like an existential hall of despair on like fucking red side band three like yeah. the game <laughs> no, didn't that's even great. Start yet, and he's already lost like he's just done like so i'm just saying that's i've always told him look i know lcs is huge for viewership but that'd be the one way if i were you i'd dip in and out i wouldn't do all the games i'd just do the big marquee ones you know and get your hits that way but he has a different mentality again his he's got more of a korean mentality like you just make yourself do it you know yeah no, i admire I mean, in a way I... it just doesn't work for me you know I mean, I'm the same way. I feel like as a streamer in this space, like, I mean, we, we saw what, what literally happened. I mean, there was literally when, when LS and I were competing in, in uh, co-streaming in like last year before I got banned, there was a week where like we would both get like 12,000 viewers every single time. We'd both be neck and neck. He took one week off and then randomly I started getting like 25K viewers and he was still at 12. Like that's what happens if you take one week off in something where so many people are competing. Like, and, and, you know, like I saw it in my own viewership, right? Like I was the number one co-streamer. I got banned for six months. I came back and, and now I'm like third or like, yeah, like third or maybe even fourth sometimes, right? Like th there's a big drop off that ends up happening within that type of market that it's just not worth taking time off. Just is what it is. Like you just, it, like it, it, it just depends if that type of stuff motivates you, you know? And I think for a lot of us that, that stream, that ends up being like what your competition is. It's like. Your viewership yes. compared to other people. And like, that's kind of your way of getting feedback as to like, whether your content's good or not. It's how many people watched your content, which isn't always true. Like, obviously like there was times where oh. like, when I started these shows, I actually thought it was going to be like a huge hit to my brand. When I started doing live viewing, I was only getting like 1K viewers doing it compared to like when I was averaging four or 5K. So it was actually really negative for me to be doing that for my brand, but I enjoyed it so much more. And I literally could not take solo queue anymore. So it was just, it, it ended up being worth it. So I think that you end up like gaining, like having different perspectives, but it's something that definitely every streamer thinks about. Every streamer who like ends up like averaging good viewers compares themselves to other streamers and has this mentality of like, where do I fit in, you know? Um, compared to that is else. dangerous for you though, mate, because your problem right now is you could have the best stream in the world. I actually think your core stream generally is the best. Like I like Ellis's in some ways, but again, it depends on what the game is. Like I'd watch him do LC Kitzer, of course. Mm -hmm. But the reason why I think yours is the best, you have like, a good mix of like analysis, you have good guests, you have good banter, etc. But your problem right now, mate, is you're not going to beat it if Doublelift turns on his stream and he has meet Yoss and Sneaky on it. Like, that's just game over. Like, there's just too many fans are going to yeah. tune in. Even if they're saying nothing. Even if it sounds like the fucking frat po three frat boys on, like, a fucking Saturday. Like, what are you sure. doing? Shit, but, I mean, there's, like, ways like... that I, like, you know, like, I mean, there's ways that I rationalize it. And then also, like, in the back of my head, I can always play victim like we talked earlier where I can be like, yeah, I mean, I was fucking banned for seven months. Or, <laughs> like, I was banned from seven months. Sure. So, like, the fact, so, like, I, I, I take that as, like, Compared to like what I had to go through, I'm succeeding. You know, like oh, for sure. most people that kills your fucking stream, period. Like at least my viewership was good enough that like people actually enjoyed watching. So there's there's always that. And then um, there's just like the fact that I like feel good after my streams. Like I feel like I've gotten to the point where I'm not completely viewership based. Like I can tell if it's a good or a bad stream based off like the emotions of it and the response of my chat. You know, like it's, it, it, there's many different ways to look at it. But yeah, I mean, there's definitely other things that like, I mean, if you're going to talk about LCS, like you say anything you want, you can have the most intelligent opinions in the world. People are going to watch the guy that won it eight times, you know, like that's the person that ends up 
you know, getting a uh, like getting getting the viewership, and it makes sense. So, I mean, I don't think that it's necessarily a negative thing, but I mean, it's it, you you're you're right when when you say it is a dangerous game because I know it's that a lot of streamers go through the same mentality, and that's why you see so many streamers end up fucking depressed. So many sure. streamers end up depressed yeah. because they're just comparing themselves to other people, and it's like it's not something that's like one to one where you can always like compare it. Like at least in in LCS, right? Like you get your score back like you perform and then like based on like what your performance is it's like you get a ranking whereas like streaming is like a lot more like ambiguous it's like well how the fuck do i just be more popular like what the fuck does that even mean like be more entertaining oh go go be entertaining what is, what the fuck does that mean you know so i think that that's like the thing that, that people fall into so it's really about like surrounding yourself and getting fulfillment out of like what you're doing which is why i do this show because at the end of like whatever we end the show i'm gonna have hopefully hundreds of episodes that I can look back on as an archive and be like, damn, that is like sure. a body of work. And then I can go back. And I, I even do this with like LCS games. I'll go back and watch a random game every now and then that I played in and like enjoy the experience and like re rethink about like, oh, where I was at that point in my life, what I was like thinking about, how our team was, what our dynamic was, like what our what what the whole situation was. And I feel like it's just an interesting way to like reflect on your life. And I'll be doing that with this show. Where I'll go back and I'll watch a an episode that we did like, two years ago or something and i'll be like okay so this is what we uh talked about oh like that's how i was asking questions back then damn i used to always say that a lot oh i said this too much now and then i watch a recent one oh i got better at this or, or that you know it's a good way to, to reflect so i mean i think there's like value in other stuff i don't even know how we got to this uh conversation sorry right, because if you haven't noticed Fedman's doing a really bad job of hiding the fact he's just mentally tapped out about 15 minutes ago, <laughs> brain. he's just been he's like me when i'm trapped in the solo queue game like when's yeah. he gonna end please when, stop talking about streaming i don't i'm not a streamer please <laughs> I mean, I'm getting to the point where it's getting a bit tired. No, I'm not, I mean, I'm not like I'm just generally like a little bit. Yeah, getting it's, more it's, tired. it's all right. Yeah, it's almost like, the end of the episode, man. We can no, it's, 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 I, I, I am listening very carefully. It's all right. All right. <laughs> No, it's, this is normally the end of the episode. We hit the two-hour mark. That's normally yeah. where we wrap it up. I mean, normally we just uh, we 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 um, open it up to our guest. If there's anything that you wanted to talk about? Any topics that you thought we were going to discuss on the show that you wanted to talk about? You didn't get the opportunity to. Like platform is yours. If there's anything you want to talk about, we can discuss it now. If not, we can just wrap it up. No, I just want to say uh, thanks. I think it's always very nice to talk to you guys and uh, you know discuss stuff and just chill and talk about uh, random stuff and just enjoy so it's always uh, always a pleasure and uh, time goes by really fast so <laughs> all right thank you man uh so yeah i mean i guess that'll be the end of the episode we hit two hours uh that was our you know our yearly feb of an episode and I, I guess maybe if you if you're out of the garden you know we can do a, a couple of the the live views of msi if you're down <laughs> oh yeah all right see ya thanks guys all right bye bye